So welcome everyone to the 15th session of the R2Y Online 2020-2021 conference. Uh, today will be the, the last session of the event. So this has been going on for three months, almost four now. And this will be the sort of closure session. And instead of having an invited speaker today, we will have Eduardo uh, Martin Martinez deliver the, the closure uh, talk in the end of the this, this session. And uh, on top of that, we'll have four contributed uh, talks. So before that, uh, we'll start with uh, Bruno Torres. Uh, he's the first speaker. And uh, Bruno is a PhD student in the University of Waterloo. And he'll be talking about uh, neutrino oscillations uh, with the aid of particle detectors to talk about these phenomena. So he'll be talking about a particle detector model for neutrino oscillations. Bruno, uh, if, you, if you can start screen sharing right now, um, the floor is yours. There you go. Can you guys see my, my screen now in full screen presentation mode? Yes, it is perfect. OK, awesome. So hello, everybody. Thank you, Thales, or should I say Rick, for the kind introduction. And as he was saying, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about a particle detector model for neutrino oscillations that is based on work that I did in collaboration with Rick and two other professors from Brazil, uh, André Landulfo and Jorge Matis. So without further ado, let's get going. So the yeah, here's a quick outline of what I'm going to be talking about. First, I'm going to make a very quick review on the very basics of neutrino physics, in particular what concerns uh, the phenomenon of neutrino flavor oscillations and how it can be phrased very, very intuitively, let's say, in terms of a quantum mechanical description like in undergraduate quantum mechanics already. Then I'm gonna quickly talk about uh, some of the subtleties that arise when you try to adapt that to a more fundamental quantum field theoretical description. Uh, with that in mind, uh, as a motivation, I'm gonna introduce particle detector models, which you all, like if you've made it this far in this conference, you've heard a lot about, but anyway, for completeness, I'm gonna briefly skim through. And then I'm gonna go to the, to the main subject, which is this formulation of flavor oscillations with particle detector models, first with a, a toy model using neutrinos as scalar fields, and then being a little bit more refined with a version of detector model that couples to neutrinos as fully fermionic. Uh, spin half particles. So here's the reference in case anybody's curious about it. So you can check both the PRD, which is open access and the archive numbers. Okay, so here's a like the, the periodic table of elementary particles that are encoded in the standard model of particle physics. Uh, you can see all the fermions and the bosons. In, in, in this case here, all we are gonna be interested about is in this uh, bottom left corner here that contains the neutrinos, which are the, the leptons with zero electric charge. So yeah, the neutrinos are the particles in the stereo model that only interact via the weak force because they're leptons. So they don't interact via the strong nuclear force and they are electrically neutral. So they don't couple to the photons. Uh, in the particle physicist jargon, the flavor of a neutrino corresponds to what charged lepton it couples to via the weak force. So uh, you have an interaction term in the standard model Lagrangian that couples neutrinos to the electron, let's say, and you call that, by definition, the, the, that field that, that appears there, you call it the, the electron neutrino and so on for the mu and theory part. Now the phenomenon of neutrino oscillations then is the observation that the neutrinos that naturally couple to one charged electron at a given interaction or a given instant of time, while they travel through free space, they can transmute into one another. And that manifests itself by the fact that you can produce one neutrino of one type via a particular uh, beta, beta decay or things like that in one place. And that will participate in an interaction with another charged electron later on. Uh, this phenomenon, the explanation of this phenomenon relies on assuming that neutrinos have mass. That's the simplest, most straightforward explanation of that. And that already is the one of the most immediate experimental hints for the necessity of physics beyond the standard model because solely within the standard model, neutrinos don't have mass. So the Higgs mechanism doesn't, doesn't work for, for neutrinos the way, uh, like with the usual ingredients that we have on, on that periodic table that I outlined on, on the first slide. 
Uh, this talk is not about physics beyond the standard model, so I'm going to be very brief about it. This is just for, for giving a little bit of context. So, yeah, the, if you're probably familiar with uh, quantum mechanical formulation of neutron oscillations by thinking of flavor states uh, as the states that are uh, created in the interactions under the case by the standard model. And by and further thinking about them as linear combinations of the states of neutrinos without defined mass. So uh, you have here a state describing the neutrino that's created by uh, an interaction with a charge electron alpha. So throughout the presentation, alpha will always be denoting uh, is always going to be denoting uh, a flavor index. So more generally, Greek indices will be referring to the flavor, and Latin indices will be referring to to massive neutrino fields. And so this is just a statement that the flavor neutrinos are a linear combination of massive neutrinos. Now, if you let this state evolve freely with the free Hamiltonian, of course, uh, each massive neutrino is gonna evolve with a different phase because the masses are different. So uh, if you wait for a certain time, you will have a non-zero probability of measuring uh, a neutrino with flavor beta, even though it was Initially created with the flavor alpha, and this probability is given by this. Now, this is the relativistic dispersion relation that we all know for massive, for massive particles. We are always going to be interested in a regime of particles that are also relativistic because the masses of neutrinos are all very small compared to the typical energies that are probed in these kinds of processes. So the time elapsed between emission and absorption is always going to be roughly given by the length that was traveled. And the energies can be approximated by this expression here, where this E can be seen as just like a typical energy that is involved in the process. And within those approximations, then that probability of oscillation is given by this. And, and this formula here, with this dependence on the PMNS element or of the mixing matrix elements and the squared of masses and the inverse of the energy and so on, this is the basis for extracting the, the various parameters. Uh, such as the matrix elements for the mixing matrix and the squared mass differences uh, by fitting that to, to experimental data. So this, even though it's a very simple uh, approach, already encodes pretty much uh, all the main uh, basic concepts that we need to account for the phenomenal oscillation and match those to, to the experiment. So whatever more refined derivation that we give to that, Phenomenon in some limit it has to to reduce to this, which is which we know already matches the observation. However, we we know that uh, a more refined version of this calculation has to be derived within the context of quantum field theory because after all that's a framework where the all the unnatural interactions are traced, and so this first quantum mechanical approach. Can be seen as a good, good approximation, but it's interesting to see how that can be can be made more refined. And in QFT, the mixing of flavor neutrinos versus massive neutrinos is made at the level of the fields that appear in the center model Lagrange and at the level of the states themselves. And that turns out to be a little bit different than one would naively expect. So yeah, the, the mixing occurs at the level of the, of, the, of the fields, as I was saying, where now each Massive neutrino field here corresponds to to the a usual Dirac field, uh, superior usual fermionic field or or a fermion that you can quantize via, for example, the usual process of canonical quantization. So you write a, a free equation of motion for each massive neutrino with its respective mass. Then you're going to solve that equation in terms of a complete set of modes. And the amplitude for each mode are going to be promoted to creation and relation operators that satisfy now the canonical anti-commutation relations for, for the fermion. As you know. And then you can define the vacuum states for each massive neutrino field as just the state that's annihilated by all the annihilation operators, both, both for particles and antiparticles, uh, that you build from these modes. Right? Now that you have that, it's reasonable to expect that the massive neutrino states that are used in the previous derivation, the quantum mechanical uh, toy model that I explained uh, a few minutes ago, these can be associated to one particle states in the QFT. So uh, roughly speaking, schematically, they're going to be seen as these excitations. 
Oh, you can, if you put a definite weight number here, then that's going to be completely localized, but you can play with weight packets or something like this to probe the localization properties. So that's pretty much well understood. But the problem is that for flavor states, the story is a little bit more complicated. Um, and within this, this language that I've been using, this can be seen from the facts that since the flavor fields are not free by definition, uh, they don't satisfy a, a free direct equation. Uh, there's no way you can naturally build a FOC basis on creation relation operators or flavor states. So right away you have uh, uh, subtlety with this idea of thinking about particles being created in each interaction vertex or stuff like this. Now you can get away with this indirectly by associating these states to particular uh, processes by, uh, as phenomenological states. That depends on what particular decay you're looking at, and I'm going to be uh, describing very briefly how that can be done in a simple example. But the takeaway message here that I want you guys to keep is that, in general, for states that don't, for fields that don't satisfy any, any meaningful free equation of motion, the definition of such neutrino flavor state is not going to be independent of the process under consideration, which in hindsight may seem Pretty reasonable, but it's something that is not trivial to see at first. So just for complete concreteness, let's imagine here an example of a typical weak decay in which you have a, a parent nucleon that decays to another nucleon emitting an anti-lepton of flavor alpha when the associated neutrino. So the final state is going to be obtained by, it can be obtained by some, by simply applying the action of the S matrix on the initial state and if you expand this, this action or, or this S matrix in terms of the action, you see that this will have some linear combinations of massive neutrino fields that come from the usual FOC basis of massive neutrino fields. Uh, the charge lepton and the, the outgoing nuclear and so on. Where by construction, these coefficients here are, are just the, the amplitudes for, for each uh, decay with a particular massive neutrino field. And you can define, uh, if, if you want to think about that final state as being some sort of product state between the neutrinos with the fine flavor and the associated charge lepton and the outgoing nucleon, uh, the state of the, the neutrino is going to be given by the projection of these states, of the, to this partial state, then once you normalize, it's given by this. And the interesting thing here is that this state in general will depend on the process. It, it explicitly depends on the matrix elements for the process that you were considering. And it will only reduce to the naive, let's say, linear combination of mass neutrino states with the PMNS matrix U that I use here, the, the, the mixing matrix that appears at the level of the fields. When the differences between neutrino masses are neglected, once the interaction is, uh, is happening, let's say, roughly speaking. And yeah, so, so this is useful to know. And this means that the notion of flavor states uh, cannot be made independent of the process. So ultimately it is uh, a useful construct, a useful uh, phenomenological construct, but you should be able to get away with phrasing the phenomenology of neutrinos without making immediate reference to that. And in particular that, raises the question that begs the question of how then can you slate, can you phrase, for example, the phenomenon of neutrino oscillations without making any notion, any mention to uh, neutrino states. Now, this was not the first time that this question was raised. There are some quantum field theoretical, pure quantum field theoretical approaches to this problem that get away with not mentioning flavor states. And for a quick review, this is one of them, but, what we want to emphasize here is that the same sort of problem can be solved very naturally and very elegantly, if you ask me, by a particle detector approach or a particle detector philosophy, let's say, applied to this particular phenomenon. So again, as I said in the beginning, if, if you've made it this far in this conference, you heard this introduction maybe 10 times, I don't know, but just for completeness, I'll go quickly go through it. A particle detector is thought of as a localized quantum system that couples to a quantum field in a finite region of space-time. And 
uh, is a very appealing tool, both from pragmatic and from fundamental points of view, uh, due to its ability to tackle the notion of measurements in quantum field theory. And it does so in a way that's very close to, to the actual way that we implement measurements in real life setup, let's say, by coupling realistic probes or physical devices to the field of interest. And as we've, we've been seeing throughout this conference, uh, this is a ubiquitous tool in the field of relative point information with applications from quantum optics and tabletop experiments to foundational issues in quantum field theory and curve space. So yeah, the, the main motivation for most of the, the times when people talk about particle detectors and particularly unrooted with detector comes from uh, simplific simplifications and approximations to the, to the lighter matter interaction, which we'll briefly review here. So in some approximation, I can, I can say that uh, I have a hydrogen-like atom with a center of mass that I'm gonna be treating as classical view. And the coupling- Bruno, five minute work. But, okay, I'll, I'll have to rush then. Uh, okay, so the idea is then that you, once you have this interaction Hamiltonian, you can decompose it in the basis of eigenstates of the of the of the free Hamiltonian detector, in which here you have the, the usual eigenstates. And if you restrict yourself to uh, one particular transition, then that Hamiltonian is simplified to this uh, to this electric field coupling to some sort of smeared dipole moment where you have the raising and lowering operators of a two-level system that is precisely the two levels of the atomic transition that you're considering. And this means that the dynamics within certain approximations you're considering just one transition can be approximated by two-level system that couples to the field with a spatial profile that's given by the smearing factor. Now, the unruly with model then is, is, can be motivated by approximating that instead of coupling to a vector field, you couple to a scalar, and then the that smearing factor becomes a smearing function, and you get the monopole moments of the of the two-level system. This was first written in terms of uh, our inertial detector in flat space times, but that can of course be generalized to arbitrary trajectories in possible curved space times. And the way I, I I like to think about this is in terms of uh, an action that can be defined like this. What with when you have a, a space times smearing now. And even though the usual interaction between particle detectors and fields is usually traced effectively in terms of Hamiltonian, this way of defining the terms of an action is pretty appealing because it makes explicit, for example, how you can relate different Hamiltonians and different coordinate systems uh, very simple, very, very directly. But the bottom line here at this point is that I wanted to think of the measurement of field of interest in terms of uh, the couple dynamics between field and detector, and then the measurement is inferred indirectly from how, how it is dynamically achieved from the probe. Uh, in other words, uh, the strategy will be to always rephrase statements that were usually made in terms of creation and annihilation of particles by statements about excitations and the excitation of detectors. And as you should all expect by now, this is the, the main conceptual step that it will be taking in. Uh, formulating a meaningful notion of flavor oscillations without making uh, reference to flavor fields. Now here I'm gonna skip a little of the the toy model with the scalar oscillations because uh, this is just preparation for what I will, I'll be saying later. And uh, yeah, I'm running a bit out of time. So, but all the concepts will be encoded in this final expression here. So the idea is that I start, so let's get back here. So the idea is that I have this interaction action in which I have uh, two detectors or two localized probes that couple to different linear combinations of massive fields, as it appears on the interaction of the standard model. And I'm gonna take uh, a process in which I start with an initial state with one of the, one of the probes excited and the other one is in its ground state. And then I'm gonna compute the amplitude for this process to sort swap the, 
one point is source to be in the ground state and that would be in the excited state. Now, once I do that, I'm gonna be taking the approximation where I'm gonna be assuming that the, the two probes are inertial and at rest with respect to each other. With each other. Then I'm just gonna go through the, the usual calculation of time-dependent perturbation theory. And what I get in the end for the, the transition rate for the process in the infinite time limit is something that looks like this. In the ultra relativistic limit, now we're gonna be understanding that as the energy gap of the source being much greater than other masses of the massive neutrinos, in which case this phase can be approximated by, by this expression. And what you get in the end is a transition rate that looks like this. So we obtain the standard dependence on the distance and on the squared masses of the phase between the, the different massive contributions. You got this delta function that imposes that the energy gap of the two probes that are being used must be equal, which is reasonable from energy conservation considerations and the infinite time limits. And you also get this overall one over L squared decay that is also expected from isotropic emission of neutrinos from the source. Uh, if I want to talk about an extra probability instead of the great rates, I'm going to normalize this by the overall decay rate for all, for all possible channels. So I get to this final uh, expression. So I think my time's up. Yeah, Bruno, your, your time's up. So it would be great to, to try to wrap up. But for now on, you're just biting into the, the question time. So keep that in mind. OK, so yeah, I'm, I'll try to be brief. So why my my intention with this scalar calculation is to reinforce our confidence that this general weight detector based approach is able to uh, accurately reproduce some of the basics of the phenomenology of neutron oscillations. But now I can take a, a step further and see how I can derive a more realistic, let's say, uh, detector model based on the neutrino being phrased as an actual fermionic field. And the way I'm going to do that is in close analogy to what we did with the light matter interaction model. And that is by taking the, the low energy theory that describes uh, weak processes, which is the Fermi theory. That's a direct current current interaction between fermionic currents that is written right here, where this J plus minus and the JZ are the charge and neutral currents that would couple to the W plus and minus and the Z bosons respectively. The expressions for them don't matter that much at this point. But this is just for completeness again. And the paradigmatic process that will motivate our approach will be nuclear beta decay, which is the main radioactive process, process that takes place in nuclear reactors and so on. And the relevant terms in the, in the Fermi theory Lagrangian can be written in terms of effective neutron proton fields that I'm writing out that appear like this. And the, the point here is to think of proton and neutron as two states within a two-level system that's encoded in the nuclear and that's very localized to the, the extension of the nucleum itself by uh, the creation of QCD bound states, which can then be described as this two-level system that's localized around a classical nuclear trajectory given by a current here. So the idea, the rough idea here is that you are somehow expand, you can, for example, think of these neutron and proton fields as fields that create and annihilate protons. And then that term on the interaction Lagrangian that appears here is something like this. So if you consider uh, just the two level system spanned by the neutron and proton that he thought of as the one particle state of neutron and proton acting uh, on the vacuum, and you're restricted to within this subspace, you can basically take that, that term in the current and replace this by this so-called semi-classical term. That is semi-classical because it contains a quantum degree of freedom given by this two-level system, but centered around a classical trajectory that's given by this uh, current term with a phase that oscillates with a mass difference between the two, uh, the two states, so the, neutron, the, the proton and the neutron. And tau here just corresponds to the proper term of the center of mass. Then I get to this interaction Lagrangian. Now I'm going to go a bit further then and uh, 
absorb the charged lepton into the energy gap uh, that's effect effectively taking place in this process. And what I end up with is an interaction action that looks like this, where the sigma plus and minus here now evolve with the energy gap that contains the difference in the masses of the neutron and the proton and the energy of the outgoing charged lepton, which is in the case, in this case, is the electron. Uh, now, all the calculations I've been doing or reduced to the case of a point like trajectory. So the interaction looks like this. And of course, I have phrased everything in terms of nuclear beta decay in mind. But for any uh, interaction that uh, occurs via charged current processes, the argument is going to go exactly the same. So if all I'm interested in is absorption and creation of neutrinos by these sorts of processes, I can replace that Fermi interaction by this sort of action here, where now I have two, two level systems that couple to different uh, flavors of neutrinos at the level of, of the interaction action. And we can perform the same calculation as in the scalar case. I'm going to skip the details here because the bottom line is going to be pretty much the same. Uh, if you go through the calculation, what you get for the decay rates is exactly the same thing now with the full uh, complex mixing matrix here and the same mass square dependence. And I get this effective coupling constant here that depends now on the energy of the process, which is something that could be expected simply from pure dimensional analysis. Uh, this is not very important. If you guys have any questions about this, we can go, go through it during the question time. And again, if you do the same trick, you normalize by the, uh, by the overall decay rates, you get the same dependence. So. Uh, I'm pretty much done here now. Uh, the bottom line is that you can conceptualize the notion of flavor oscillations without a notion of flavor states. This can be very elegantly achieved by the you know, particle detector model, where now the particle detector, instead of being uh, motivated from the line interaction model, is based on the, the weak processes that take place. And this particle detector model that uh, closely approaches the Yarrow-Druid model can be indeed motivated from the Fermi theory of the interaction. So this strengthens our confidence on particle detection models as a useful uh, venue for exploring measurement in QFT, now in the context of high energy physics. And it vindicates the idea that uh, flavor states are not necessary for the phenomenology of nuclear oscillations. From the perspective of relative small information, this also motivates uh, for explorations on different uh, notional particle detectors, which is some, something that Rick and Eduardo are currently exploring. And you should expect to hear to hear about that soon, I, expect, I see. But for now, that's all I have. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Bruno. Sorry about the, the sorry about Sorry about the, the length. I, I, no, that's yeah. fine. We just have a little bit less time for the questions. Well, that's all. Thank okay. you, Bruno. That's all. <laughs> And if there are any uh, questions, uh, please use the raise hand feature on Zoom or just uh, raise your hands uh, on your video camera. And yeah, so I already see a question from Robert. Uh, Rob, please. Uh, yeah, OK, uh, thank you. I think it's an interesting idea to try and map these kind of interactions uh, to the particle detector models, but I'm confused about, uh, I mean, the last part went by fast, so I could have missed something, but I, I'm confused about how you say there isn't any reference to flavor states because the weak current, the lepton current is a flavor current. It's, it's a flavor doublet that's interacting with another flavor doublet that's effectively the neutron proton doublet, though it's really the up down quark doublet. But anyway, that's that's OK. But my point is, is that I, I don't understand how you say there isn't any reference to flavor because the current itself refers to flavor. So I'm yeah, not I, quite getting that. Yeah, the, the idea is that the flavor mixing is fine from the from at the level of the fields, which is what shows up on, on the interaction Lagrangian. The problem is when you try to build uh, states that represent excitations of those flavor fields, that's when it becomes problematic. So any mention that you make to flavor occurs at the level of the interaction that shows up in the Lagrangian. 
right? And that doesn't lead automatically to flavor states as in a fog basis or something. So this is the thing that I was trying to avoid. Does that make sense? Well, <clears throat> sort of. I mean, I guess I'll have to think about it a little bit more, but I mean, you're, you're taking Fermi's four-point interaction and mapping it to a particle detector model, but your BN, BP dagger are flavor states, right? You're creating and destroying flavor. So wh why isn't that referral to flavor? That's the part I'm not quite getting. Yeah, the idea is that for the charge laptop, basically for any, for any particle except the neutrino, that's the particle that oscillates, you can define, uh, you can have a well-defined flavor, let's say for the electron, for example, because there is a flavor basis for the electron. The electron itself doesn't oscillate. Neither does the neutron or the proton, for example. But so, so in this case, that's fine. That's, that's when the two, let's say that's when I, I can't uh, make the two notions compatible. When I can't diagonalize both bases uh, simultaneously, let's say, I can diagonalize the, both matrices simultaneously that I, that I have to, to, to make a choice. So if I may jump in here, Rob, in case it's helpful, uh, my impression is that he writes, you know, these interaction Lagrangian in terms of these flavor fields. And then he says, you can always, of course, rewrite uh, these flavor fields now in terms of the, the massive, uh, the, the fields for the massive freely propagating uh, uh, neutrinos. So you can just use this linear combination and substitute then and write everything then in terms of those fields because then the states that they create, he likes those uh, when discussing them, you know, freely propagating particles. So it's just that you take the Lagrangian, the usual Lagrangian in terms of flavor fields and you use the linear combination that relates those to the fields that correspond to the diagonal sort of um, uh, mass matrix substitutes in terms of those and then discusses everything in terms of those. And in particular, then when you talk about, you know, some particles that were created and will freely propagate for a long distance, you're doing that in terms of, uh, you know, the, 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 the fields and the Fox states associated to the fields that corresponded to the diagonal uh, mass matrix, I think. So is that a fair description, uh, Bruno? Yeah, that's a pretty accurate description of, of the idea behind it. So, uh, I, I think I, I've not been emphatic enough about it during the presentation, but the point is precisely that once you're defining the interaction, what you're actually do like when, when you do it in terms of the spectrum of real particles, what you're doing is declaring that there is a flavor field, which is this linear combination of massive fields, which is fine. It's just a field redefinition. You're defining the field in terms of this linear combination of massive fields. And you need to do that because that's how the weak interaction goes. That's that, that, that's the thing that couples to the charged electrons, which define the flavor. But but I didn't say that there wouldn't be any mention to flavor at all. All I said is that you shouldn't have to mention flavor states, which are these fog fog states associated to to some flavor eigenvalues. So, is that clear? Uh, uh, well, I mean, it's an improvement. I'll think about it. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay, so there's another question from Christiane Klein. So please unmute, unmute yourself. Yes, thank you for your very nice talk, Bruno. Uh, one quick question. Um, what would change if your neutrinos are Majorana neutrinos instead of direct neutrinos, or would everything go through the same way? Yeah, uh, the, the different character of neutrinos as being Majorana or direct doesn't influence this particular kind of process uh, because oscillations by themselves don't, especially in this uh, high energy limit, they're blind to whether the neutrinos are, are Majorana or Dirac. Uh, like, I think you could phrase processes such as neutrinoless double beta decay in terms of the same notion of uh, particle detector models, pretty much mimicking what I did here. And that is a process that can probe whether neutrinos might run or not. But when, when it comes to oscillations uh, alone, I, I don't see any way that this could be a to this case. This is, uh, all we did here is based on the usual uh, conservative formula Grandin for the, the usual neutrino oscillations. So uh, at this point, I, I wouldn't say uh, this, this can say anything about neutrinos being run or direct. That's, does that make sense? Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. So, are there any any other questions? So, in that case, I, I do have a question, uh, Bruno. 
you have introduced a we have introduced a linear right a uh, uh, particle detector model on fermionic fields right so this looks like it breaks the u1 symmetry that these fields tend to have so how do you go around that okay that's a very good question so this is a comment that uh, people often make when they hear about this linear fermionic detector model i've been a bit quick here but let's go back to to the main slide the point here is that uh okay so uh just for more context the field that's being brought here is the neutrino again and everything else i'm defining as a detector so one might say that it looks like you're coupling a whole detector that here encodes a fermion degree freedom as well to a fermion that's uh linearly coupled and that usually uh, threatens to break U1 symmetry. But the point here is to think about it this way. Uh, this is how I like to think about it anyway. Uh, U1 symmetry really refers to charge conservation, right? And so all of what we are doing here is just to declare that if you have a fermionic field that couples linearly to a detector, what, what you have to do in order to keep your one symmetry is just make that creation that creation and annihilation operators of the detector parts also be charged under U1. And then when you do the transformation, the two terms cancel each other and it, it, it's all okay. In this case, it's even simpler because uh, the neutrino itself is not charged. So if you were to be weak about it, maybe you wouldn't even have to worry about this, but you can also make this more uh, generally by considering the case of coupling to a generic complex scalar field, for example, which is something you're very much familiar with. And, and this is how the argument would go. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for the talk. So if there aren't any other uh, questions, we can thank Bruno again. OK. Thank you for your time. And mm -hmm. yes. <clears throat> thank you for the talk. Let me just pause the recording. Right, welcome everyone to the second talk of today by Alessio Laponi from the University of Camerino. And he's gonna to talk to us today about quantum communication across semi-transparent moving mirrors. Alessio, please, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, basically this is the work uh, I've done for my master thesis. And uh, for the um, quantum communication across semi-transparent moving mirrors, the aim is to consider basically the uh, semi-transparent moving mirrors in a quantum field theory in course space time point of view, and to see if uh, the effects arising from this theory can uh, improve the quantum communication for a mirror. So let's start. First of all, I should, uh, um, I should say that the mirror are described in a one plus one dimensional space time in this context. And the objects in such a space time can be compact represented by the following Penrose diagram. Basically, this is a compact representation of the whole one plus one dimensional space time. The vertical axis, in fact, corresponds to the variable uh, T prime, the horizontal axis to the variable X prime, and they are related to the real space time variables X and T through the following relation. This means basically that the um, the infinities of space and time are represented by the vertices of this diamond. So for example, I minus represents the infinite time like past, I plus the infinite time like future, and I zeros the uh, space like infinities. The curve you see there are basically generic time like trajectories, so trajectories of massive objects. And the blue one in particular is a massive object with a speed which is asymptotic to the speed of light. Now, considering a static semi-transparent mirror, by the definition of semi-transparency, obviously a portion of the input signal will be transmitted and another portion will be reflected. If the mirror moves at a constant speed, a similar thing occurs, but with some redshift or blue shift effects. What if instead the mirror accelerates? Well, in that case, a new effect arises from quantum field during curved space time, namely the particle production from vacuum. In fact, the relation between the output normal modes and the input ones are described by the following Bogoliubov transformation. Hence, the uh, gen a generic output normal mode is dependent not only on the input one, but also by in their complex conjugate. And uh, it is known by quantum field theory course space time that if, um, if the beta Bogoliubov coefficient, so this uh, parameter here is different than zero, a particle production from vacuum occurs. In particular, it is created for the vacuum 
from the vacuum uh, the following spectrum of particles given by this integral. Now, for perfectly reflecting moving mirrors, uh, the beta probability of coefficient is the following. And one can prove that this is different than zero if and only if the mirror accelerates. Hence, only in that case, we get a particle production. Here, I have defined the following uh, uh, variables for simplicity, which are the null variables. And the trajectory of the mirror is specified by uh, this function, p of u, which uh, indicates the position v of the mirror in function of the variable u. Why is it so important to study accelerating mirrors? Well, first of all, the radiation uh, by accelerating mirrors was experimentally proved through the dynamical Casimir effect. And the observation lead to, uh, um, to radiation which is really small. So for now, we are far from creating a technology with that, but who knows in future. Secondly, a perfectly effective moving mirror with a particular trajectory, namely the carlitz billy trajectory indicated by this equation, reproduces exactly the same spectrum of particles produced by a gravitational collapse or uh, other collapsing geometry. And this includes also the Hawking radiation considering black hole collapses. Hence, accelerated mirrors could be considered as black hole analogous, and one can study black hole collapses properties through accelerated mirrors. Now, uh, the first aim of this work was to extend what it was done for perfectly reflecting moving mirrors, including semi-transparency. Why should we do that? Well, uh, for the optical point of view, obviously a perfectly reflecting mirror is only an approximation. We know that each real mirror is transparent for high frequencies, while the perfectly reflecting limit is achieved only for low frequencies. Secondly, the mirror black hole analogy described before fails when one, con when one considers coordinates which have a singularity in the center of the collapsing ball. So for example, the Eddington Fickerstein coordinates. This occurs for several mathematical reasons. I suggest the reference of um, the book of Fabry in that if you want more details. However, including semi-transparency, one, one can overcome this problem and provide the black hole analogous even in this kind of coordinates. Now, uh, the main difference between the um, perfectly reflecting case and the semi-transparent case is that um, in order to study the Bogolub of transformation, one should also consider the um, left part of the mirror if we put the detector at the right of it. Because uh, um, to, the, to a generic output mode, there are two kinds of input, uh, of input modes that gives a contribute. Uh, the one in particular, the input mode incoming from the right and reflected by the mirror, and the input mode incoming from the left and transmitted by the mirror. Hence, the generic Bogolub of transformation this time is this one. And uh, we have so uh, two kinds of alpha Bogolub of coefficients and two kinds of beta Bogolub of coefficients. Uh, one related to the reflection of uh, a vacuum mode incoming from right, and uh, the other given by the transmission of uh, the vacuum mode in, um, incoming from left. Regarding the uh, reflection and transmission amplitudes, um, I have obtained that uh, starting from the following Lagrangian density, which is basically a Lagrangian density of a massless scalar field interacting with a delta light potential with strength alpha, which is basically the mirror itself. And with that, uh, they obtain the following amplitudes for the reflection and the transmission. And trivially, the perfect reflecting limit is achieved for alpha going to plus infinity. However, this is valid for the static case. In case of an accelerating mirror, we have a big mathematical problem since um, the reflection and transmission amplitudes becomes time dependent. Um, simply because uh, they depend on the speed that the mirror has at a certain time. This gives a great mathematical complication since also the boundary condition between the left and the right of the mirror changes in time. To overcome this problem, I used the following strategy. Firstly, I have considered the modes in proper coordinates, so in the mirror frame. Why? Well, basically because uh, in this frame, the mirror is static and one can use um, the time independent amplitude seen before. Then I have passed to external coordinates through another Bogolub of transformation, through a sort of completeness relation, basically. Using this strategy, I have obtained the following general expressions for the Bogolub of coefficients for semi transparent accelerating mirrors. Here I have defined the variables um, overline u and overline v, which are basically the null variables in the mirror frame, so in proper coordinates. And the trajectory of the mirror is now specified by the functions uh, overline u of u prime and overline v of v prime, which are functions mapping the 
uh, external coordinates, the null external coordinates to the null proper coordinates. Um, we can see that these Bogolibov coefficients, however, are really harsh to compute. And for now, uh, mm, there is not a trajectory for the semi-transfer mirror providing an analytic expression for them. In order to find a simple expression, I've uh, used the following approximation, which consists in considering the following class of uh, trajectories for the mirrors. And the mirrors with such a trajectory are named impulsive accelerated mirrors, and they are described by the following Penrose diagram. Basically, they are mirrors initially at rest that impulsively accelerate toward the left in a really short period of time, mu zero. And after this acceleration period, the mirror continues to travel to an inertial speed. Now, using the uh, carlitz billy trajectory as trajectory during the acceleration period and the following parameters, this obtained the following plot of the spectrum of particles produced by impulsive accelerated mirrors with different values of uh, the final speed of the mirror, which is now indicated by nu for simplicity. Looking at it, as expected, the more is the final speed of the mirror, the more is the acceleration during the uh, short acceleration period, and hence the more is the particle production. One can also uh, prove that uh, analytically that n of omega is monotonic, increasing um, no. And one can find uh, the limit of the spectrum for no going to plus infinity. So for the final speed of the mirror, really close to the speed of light. In that case, I've obtained the following expression, which provides so an upper bound for the spectrum of particles produced by impulsive accelerated mirrors. So this is the best that uh, an accelerating mirror can do in terms of particle production. Okay, now let's pass to the quantum communication framework. I have considered in particular the following communication scheme. So I've considered the transmission of an input with frequency omega incoming from the left and outgoing to the right. So the detector is again at the right of the mirror. To study that, the input signal is considered as a one-mode Gaussian state and the mirror is considered as a one-mode Gaussian channel. Now, by quantum information uh, with continuous variable systems, uh, the entropic quantities of our mode Gaussian state are related to its covariance matrix sigma. For the input, the covariance matrix is the following, where the quadrature operators Q and P are uh, dependent on the bosonic operator of the input, AL. Um, AL basically is the bosonic operator of uh, an input incoming from the left. For the output, one has exactly the same, but we should consider the bosonic operator B instead of the bosonic operator AL in the quadrature operators. And the bosonic operator B are the output bosonic operators, uh, which are related to the input ones for uh, this other Bogolyubov of transformation in a similar way to the modes. Now, it is known that under a one-mode Gaussian channel, the covariance matrix of the input evolves in this way. So one can compute uh, sigma in and sigma out and find the components of the matrices T and N, which characterize entirely the Gaussian channel, the one-mode Gaussian channel, which is the mirror. By a study of Alexander Olivo, it's then proved that the average attenuation amplification can be studied from the determinant of the matrix T. Instead, the average number of noisy particles created by the channel, so the average additive noise, can be studied from the determinant of N with this equation. Using this strategy, I've obtained the following general expressions for the average attenuation amplification in time and the average additive noise in time for semi-transparent accelerating mirrors. The important thing to notice about this expression is that both of them are related only on the Bogolyubov coefficients. This means that if uh, we want to study uh, a semi-transparent mirror through uh, its Bogolyubov coefficients, so in the quantum field theory in course space time point of view, one obtains not only the particle production properties, but also all the quantum communication properties. Now, this was the general case. Let's focus now on the mirrors introduced before, so in the impulsive accelerated mirrors. The expression for the average attenuation amplification is the following. It is dependent only on the uh, ratio on the, of the, between the frequency and the strength of the delta-like potential and on the final speed of the mirror. Now. Studying uh, this function, one can find that 
the channel is lossy because tau is always less than one. And hence, t can be considered as an average transmission coefficient. Nevertheless, the loss, if the mirror moves toward the left, the loss is always reduced with respect to the case in which the mirror is static. So the transmission coefficient increases respect uh, to the one of uh, a static semi-transparent mirror. From this, uh, one can expect that the, the more is the final speed of the mirror and the more is the transmission coefficient. However, this, uh, uh, this is true only until the final speed of the mirror reaches a particular value, a sort of critical velocity. And after this critical velocity, uh, the transmission coefficient starts to slightly decrease in order to reach an asymptotic value. <clears throat> Sorry. The result is that for each input frequency omega, there is a critical final velocity of the mirror that maximizes the transmission. And this critical velocity is given by the following analytic expression. In particular, for low frequencies, the critical velocity becomes close and close to the speed of light, and so it's harder to reach. Instead, for high frequencies, this critical velocity is asymptotic from above uh, to the finite value 0 0.8 times the speed of light, which is named high frequency critical speed. Here is a plot of the transmission coefficient for an impulsive accelerated mirror for three different cases. The static case, so in which nu is equal to one, nu equal to 10, which is an impulsive accelerated mirror with a final speed comparable with the high frequency critical speed 0 0.8, and nu equal to 1,000, which is the, an impulsive accelerated mirror with a final speed really close to the speed of light, namely 0 0.999. Because of the presence of a critical velocity, one can observe that uh, the curve nu equal to 1,000 dominates over nu equal to 10 only for low frequencies. While for high frequencies, since uh, this final velocity is more close to the um, critical velocity, nu equal to 10 is uh, always slightly higher than nu equal to 1,000. This means that to maximize the transmission for low frequencies, it is more convenient to accelerate the mirror to a speed really close to the speed of light. For high frequencies instead, it is more convenient to accelerate the mirror to a speed close to the high frequency critical speed 0 0.8. Now, let's say some words about the additive noise. Well, considering uh, the continuous limit for the frequencies, um, so an ideal detector which can achieve precisely each frequency without errors, in that case, uh, we have no additive noise. Hence, in this limit, the channel is a beam splitter. From that, the calculation of the capacities of the channel is straightforward, since uh, from quantum information with continuous variable system, uh, it is known that beam splitter-like channels are additive. Hence, one can find for the mirrors an exact solution for the constrained classical capacity and the quantum capacity which for impulsive accelerated mirror is given maximizing zero and the maximized current information, which is given by this analytic expression. Alessio, uh, five minute warning. Hmm? Five minute Sorry? warning. The, the five minutes, you have five minutes until yeah, we reach our question. Yeah, remaining with two slides. Perfect. <laughs> two slides remaining. Um, okay, here are uh, two plots of the constraint classical capacity with the energy constraint equal to five and the maximized coherent information for impulsive accelerated mirrors for the three cases described before for tau. One can observe that the behavior is uh, really close to the, um, to the tau one. So uh, for low frequencies, no equal to 1000 dominates, while for high frequencies, no equal to 10 is slightly higher in both the cases. However, we have a great difference between the two because for the classical capacity, one can observe that we have always a peak and this peak becomes higher and higher, the more is the final speed of the mirror. So, for example, if you want to maximize the classical capacity, it is obviously more convenient to take uh, nu equal to 1000 because the peak is higher. So it is more convenient to accelerate the mirror to a speed as close as possible to the speed of light. Instead, looking at the maximized coherent information, one can observe that the range of frequencies in which nu equal to 1000 is much greater than nu equal to 10, is the same range of frequencies in which the maximized current information is negative. Hence, in this range, the quantum capacity is always zero, regardless of the final speed of the mirror. Instead, in the range uh, from this more or less on of the frequencies, <clears throat> so in the range in which the quantum capacity is uh, greater than zero, 
nu equal to 10 is always higher than nu equal to 1000. This means that differently from the classical capacity case, in order to maximize the quantum capacity, it is more convenient to accelerate the mirror. No more until a speed as close as possible to the speed of light. But it's more convenient to stop to 0.8, so to the high frequency critical speed. So to conclude, a general expression for the volume of coefficients was found for semi-transparent moving mirrors using proper coordinates. Then it was proved that <clears throat> the transmission and noisy generation properties of accelerated mirror can be expressed through their Bogolyov of coefficient. Then I have studied the properties of particle production, transmission, and noisy generation for impulsive accelerated mirrors. So for mirrors with a strong acceleration in a small time period. Evaluating then the capacities, it was proved that in order to maximize the classical capacity, one has to accelerate a mirror to a speed as close as possible to the speed of light. In order to maximize the quantum capacity, it is more convenient to accelerate the mirror until a speed different than C, namely 0.8 for high frequency inputs. Um, from this work, uh, the future goals are the following. Uh, first of all, I would like to study uh, the same problem considering wave packets instead of monochromatic waves. Because in that case, uh, I provide a more realistic case for the detector, which can achieve each frequency with a certain range of error. And by the Heisenberg principle, this allows also to include the time dependency to the problem. Secondly, we would like to research uh, a trajectory which provides an analytic solution for the Bogolyov of coefficients. And uh, this hasn't been done yet. Lastly, we would like to research a cosmological analogous for an impulsive accelerated mirrors, as Carly uh, Spilley accelerated mirrors uh, have uh, the um, uh, geometry in collapsing balls, so collapsing stars or uh, collapsing black holes as cosmological analogous. So thank you for the attention. Thank you, Alessio, for this talk. So now you have uh, 15 minutes for, for questions. So um, if you have any questions, please use the, the raise hand feature. And we already have a question from Rob Mann. Uh, please, Rob. Uh, yeah, thanks. So um, in the, you're finding that at low frequencies, higher speed maximizes communication, information, so on. But at higher frequencies, it's some intermediate speed. Do you have any insight or knowledge as to what that is? Like you've only done 110 and 100, or sorry, 110 and 1,000, I guess. So maybe 300 is the maximum one. Do you, do you have any insight as to, for a given frequency, what will maximize the channel capacity or coherent information? Yes, yes, it's, the, it's this one, basically. It depends on the frequency, and it is this. OK, so, so it's value. that particular. And, but it, so is that true for all of those quantities? Because it looks like, like you've got information, you've got channel capacity. Is it always this value of new critical for all of them? Um, I think yes, because uh, um, uh, this critical velocity maximizes the transmission tau. and. Uh, from the expression, uh, this is uh, obviously uh, direct, directly proportional to that. Not, not directly, okay, but uh, however proportional to it. And uh, basically, one of the same for the um, quantum capacity. Okay, in the quantum capacity, I have explicitated the uh, tau, but uh, the correct formula will be the logarithm with base two of uh, tau over one minus tau. Um, so I think, okay. yes. So it's always that value. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Rob. Um, any more more questions from, from the audience? Well, if there aren't any more questions, then let's thank Alessio again. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you for the invitation. And let me stop the recording here so that we can move on to the next speakers. So now we head into the third contributed talk of the day. Uh, Sasha Lang will be delivering this talk and he'll be talking about quantum radiation in the electric media with dispersion and dissipation. So Sasha, uh, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot for this introduction. I'm a PhD student at Helmholtz Zentrum Dresden Rossendorf, or in short HZDR, in the group of Ralf Schützold. And along with Will Anru, 
we are working on this project studying um, analog um, experiments and other types of quantum radiation in dispersive and dissipative dielectric media. In this conference, we've already heard several talks on analog experiments and quantum simulation. And in principle, there's a large variety of systems that can be used for this kind of studies, including Bose-Einstein condensates, superconducting circuits, dielectric media, and many more. All of those systems have the drawback that they never exactly reproduce relativistic behavior due to material properties such as dispersion and dissipation. To circumvent this problem, it's always a good idea to study and compare different analog systems and their outcomes. And that's why it's reasonable to have a look at several systems and we will focus on dielectric media today. Assume you have a given medium and you want to set up a theoretical description for quantum radiation, for example, in an optical fiber. Depending on how far material properties need to be taken into account, you can in principle choose between different possible models. Supposing that you don't need to incorporate dispersion and dissipation at all, you can essentially just use some scalar Klein-Gordon type field theory with a reduced effective speed of light inside the medium. This causes the dispersion relation to adopt a smaller slope, but still a constant one, so you still have quasi-relativistic behavior. In the analog gravity literature, one usually goes one step further and also takes dispersion into account. The state-of-the-art model used here is the so-called Hopfield model, and I will come back to this in more details later. But for now, I've just drawn an exemplary plot of a Hopfield type dispersion relation for the most straightforward medium one can think of. And in this case, we just have two discrete bands of frequencies omega as functions of wave number. In principle, one can include more and more energy bands to make the model more and more realistic. And that's essentially the framework Maxime, for example, was using in the talk he gave a couple of weeks ago. In our project, we go into a slightly different direction. And instead of including more energy bands, we have incorporated dissipation into the theory. So what should a dissipative medium actually look like? It will have some chromostronic type dispersion relation, which generally has complex roots of the dispersion. So unless, or unlike in this case here, we don't get discrete frequencies um, that are real for every real wave number. Therefore, it's quite common to instead consider a dielectric permittivity function epsilon, which is generally complex and has a shape more or less of the type depicted here with the real part here drawn in blue, which essentially accounts for dispersion and an imaginary part here depicted in orange, which is mainly responsible for dissipation. Depending on the specific medium, there are one or several regions where we have this characteristic pattern. It occurs close to the resonance frequencies of the medium. And usually they are rather narrow and sharply localized, those peaks. So usually the imaginary part responsible for dissipation plays a role mainly in a regime close to the medium resonances. But still, dissipation can play a role for quantum radiation, even if the generated particles do not live close to a resonance. For example, if they have low frequencies somewhere here, because in principle, they might stem from incoming fluctuations at the beginning that have belonged to a different regime. And therefore it's reasonable to reconsider some calculations of quantum radiation in presence of dissipation to have a look whether this has an effect. The plan for today is mainly to introduce our dispersive and dissipative model. And we base this model on a straightforward system Lagrangian that has in general space-time dependent parameters that can be tuned. And this approach allows us to canonically quantize the theory 
and treat quantum radiation in a very straightforward manner without additional assumptions. And in this framework, we can essentially calculate quantum radiation both in perturbative and non-perturbative scenarios. So far, we've mainly focused on perturbation theory, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. But as a long-term goal, we plan to apply the scheme to non-perturbative scenarios, such as analog black hole horizons as well. But before diving into details, let me give you a rough line of argument of what I'm going to present. As a starting point, I should specify the particular system we are going to look at. And this will be an effectively one plus one dimensional medium located on a straight line, which we will consider to be the X axis. You can easily just think of some waveguide or fiber like system. The quantities we essentially want to study are the electric and magnetic field inside the medium. And for reasons of simplicity, we assume them to be perpendicular to each other and fixed in orientation. These assumptions are rather convenient, but more recently we have adapted our model to three dimensions where we don't need constraints on the polarization of the medium uh, of the fields, for example. On the next slide, I'm going to set up a state-of-the-art dispersive but non-dissipative hop field model for this past particular system, and we will arrive at the dispersion relation I've already shown before. In the next step, I will establish a pathway for dissipation by coupling our medium to an environment field which can carry away energy and information. In case of homogeneous media, our model can be solved rather easily, and we will have a look at this and eventually obtain dynamics that have this chromosphonic type pattern that we expect. And eventually, as a brief application, we will have a look at the scenario yielding quantum radiation by switching dissipation, which is the coupling between our medium and the environment, on and off. And this generates particles. And somehow the switching mechanism is a bit similar to what one usually often has in mind when considering particle detectors that are coupled to and decoupled from an environment field in a fast and non-adiabatic manner. But before coming to applications, let's start with the model. And first, the non-dissipative case. We start with our one-dimensional medium. And given this one dimension and fixed field orientations, we can describe both the electric and magnetic field inside the medium in terms of a one plus one dimensional vector potential A, which is a function of T and X, and yields this contribution to a Lagrangian, which just corresponds to a free scalar field. In order to incorporate the, co incorporate the polarization of the medium, we add a continuous field of harmonic oscillators with spring constants omega to all points of the medium, and denoting their amplitude with psi, which is a function of t and x, those oscillators contribute this term to the Lagrangian. To establish coupling between the matter field and the electromagnetic field, we use the dipole approximation and couple the matter oscillators to the derivative of the potential, which up to a sign is just the electric field. And we label the interaction strength with little g. The equations of motion in our setup have a rather straightforward form. We have an inhomogeneous wave equation for the potential, which is driven by the matter field. And at each point x of the medium, the matter field satisfies this harmonic oscillator equation, which is driven by the electric field. So far, our model works for arbitrary space-time dependent profiles of this resonance frequency omega and the coupling strength little g. In the case of constant parameters, we can easily decouple these equations of motion and arrive at this Hopfield type dispersion I've already drawn before. I just want to add two more details concerning the lower band. It grows linear and quasi-relativistic in the low frequency regime. That's the regime mainly interesting for analog gravity experiments. And it flattens and approaches the asymptotic value of the resonance frequency at large wave numbers. 
the second band starts above a certain band gap and is not that relevant for our studies today. In order to include dissipation, one should now add some kind of environment. And the standard approach for doing this, for example, in the fam famous Hutner Barnett model for dispersive and dissipative dielectrics, one does this by coupling each matter oscillator to a bath of oscillators that have a continuous set of frequencies. However, this approach has certain drawbacks for studying analog gravity phenomena, especially quantum radiation, because either equations get really complicated or one has to make additional assumptions, such as assuming an empirically given dispersion relation and using such an empirically given expression, it's rather difficult to later study dynamics of system parameters in a canonical framework. And that's why we are following a different approach and we couple each of our meta oscillators instead of using a harmonic path to an environment field, which involves the position of the corresponding meta oscillator X, the time T as arguments, and an additional coordinate measured in a perpendicular direction. And this field can carry away energy and information perpendicularly from the medium. As a model Lagrangian, we add to the usual Hopfield model we had before two additional terms which account for the environment field. The first one accounts for the system, just for the contributions of this pure field. It's just a two plus one dimensional scalar field which just propagates into a single direction, namely the Xi direction, because we here just have one term involving spatial derivatives. And to couple our environment to the medium, we add another dipole term, which looks more or less the same as in the standard Hopfield Lagrangian, where we couple the matter field to the derivative of the environment field evaluated along the line of the medium. And here, we name the coupling constant as opposed to little g before now capital G. To avoid confusion, I should briefly stress that this additional coordinate psi here does not necessarily have to be a real spatial coordinate, but it could equally well be some intrinsic coordinate that labels some internal degrees of freedom that might absorb energy. So this is not essentially um, an assumption that we need that this additional dimension exists in space. Working out Euler Lagrange equations for this model yields expressions rather similar to the Hopfield model with some additional terms labeled orange here. The matter field acquires an additional source term involving the environment field along the line of the medium where psi equals zero. And the environment field itself satisfies this inhomogeneous wave equation with an inhomogeneity sharply peaked along the medium and driven by the matter field. In order to solve our model, one can now, in principle, write down a formal solution of this last equation. And by plugging this result back into the remaining equations of motion, it's possible to decouple and, in principle, solve them. And we are going to do this explicitly for the case of a homogeneous medium here, where all material parameters, omega, little g, and capital G, the coupling constants, are constant in space and time. And as said before, we need to write down a formal solution for the environment field. And this can be decomposed into one term accounting for this or this chi zero term accounting for the general solution of the corresponding homogeneous problem and the second term which constitutes a particular solution of the full differential equation from the previous slide which i've just written down as a reminder again this solution involves the coupling parameter and the retarded version of the matter field and it can be obtained from the inhomogeneity in the differential equation and the retarded Green's function of the differential operator on the left-hand side. Working with the retarded Green's function, it's pretty obvious that the phi zero field actually constitutes 
the incoming field which enters the system from Psi at infinity and approaches the medium before interacting with the dielectric itself. Sasha, a uh, five minute warning. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, as said before, those, this formal solution can now be used to decouple the remaining equations of motion. And doing this, after a few steps, one arrives at this decoupled equation for the vector potential, which just involves this lengthy but straightforward differential operator acting on the vector potential. And this expression equals an inhomogeneity in which this phi zero, being the solution of this weight equation there, constitutes a known source term. And this equation can, in principle, be solved rather easily. In order to obtain a dispersion relation, we just consider the homogeneous part of this equation, so without the source term, and arrive after some trivial steps at this relation connecting the squares of wave numbers and frequencies by this frequency dependent prefactor, which just corresponds to the dielectric permittivity. And the same dispersion relation also arises, for example, from the classical harmonic oscillator model that one can easily write down for a dissipative medium. And in addition to that, by extracting the real and imaginary parts of this epsilon here, we arrive at the Kramer's chronic type behavior that one would expect to have. So our model seems to be quite reasonable from a physical point of view, and it has another advantage because it can be quantized in quite a straightforward manner. In fact, the quantum field operators after canonical quantization satisfy the same equations of motion as the classical fields. So they can be decoupled in precisely the same manner as before. And doing the same steps, one arrives at an equation analogous to this one, where just the classical fields A and Psi zero, Psi zero have to be replaced with operators. And we are going to study this equation in more detail on the next slide. I've written it down here again. So same expression as before, except for two operator heads. And in our case, the source term phi zero is now um, still a free field in two plus one dimensions that propagates in psi direction only. It can be explicitly written down rather easily. We can, in the standard manner, expand it in terms of exponentials where here k and kappa denote wave numbers in x and psi direction, respectively. And the operator valued coefficients just correspond to standard bosonic annihilation operators of this incoming environment field. And after substituting this term back in here, it's relatively easy to show that the expression given down here for the vector potential is a particular solution of this full inhomogeneous weight equation. It has a form more or less the same as pi zero, except for a lengthy prefactor, which is part of this fraction here. And what one would usually do now is um, use this particular solution and add the general solution of the corresponding homogeneous problem. But those solutions are all exponentially damped in time, and therefore, if the system has been prepared sufficiently far in the past, they have already canceled away and do not contribute to our A field anymore. And therefore, this particular solution is somehow the full solution of our problem and just constitutes some steady state solution. And corresponding expressions can also be written down for all other field and momentum operators. And it can be shown rather easily that these operators automatically satisfy the bosonic canonical commutation relations if we just demand those BK kappa operators from here to be bosonic annihilators. And as another useful feature, these steady state solutions also diagonalize the system Hamiltonian. So after plugging them in, everything reduces to this simple form here, which is convenient for many applications, I assume. But in our case, it mainly implies that the vacuum with respect to this pi zero field, so annihilated by those annihilation operators, is also the vacuum state of our full theory. And having a well-defined vacuum is a, the basic foundation for studying quantum vacuum phenomena. So having 
set up the model so far. Um, I'd just like to briefly, in the last step, consider a scenario of quantum radiation. We will consider a scenario, as said before, where we switch on and off dissipation by tuning the coupling parameter between medium and environment in a time-dependent manner. We do this in a perturbative picture, initially supposed to have two decoupled subsystems. On the one hand, a non-dissipative Hopkins dielectric with A and Psi field, and on the other hand, the environment field Psi, both decoupled initially and in their ground states. Then we switch perturbation by this time-dependent profile, which is just a Lorentzian of width tau and height G naught, and eventually arrive at a state where photons occur in both the medium and the environment. Then we can easily consider or assume that the switching time here actually has to be relatively short in order to allow for particle production. But on the other hand, it's quite reasonable to assume that it's still notably larger than the inverse of the eigenfrequencies of the harmonic oscillator field. And under this assumption, particle creation mainly occurs here in the lower band and in the low energy regime. And under a series of approximations, we can work out an approximate result for the particle number created per length of the medium. And this is this expression here, which depends on the perturbation in second order of the peak value. It also depends on the ratio of the coupling strength little g and the resonance frequency omega. But this ratio is closely related to the low energy refractive index. So it's usually of order one. But still here, we have a factor that is comparably small because of this assumption. Nevertheless, our mechanism of quantum radiation could still be more significant than other types of quantum radiation and dielectric materials because it's quite common that all of them yield rather small particle numbers. And in one more step, one can infer something about particle dynamics, for example, by studying field correlations, for example, between the environment field and the electromagnetic field inside the medium. And by studying those correlations, one finds particle production to essentially occur in pairs with one partner inside the medium and the other one escaping to the environment. And now, knowing that I'm already over time, I'd just like to give three brief conclusions summarizing some essential features of our talk. First of all, by adding the scalar environment field to a state-of-the-art dispersive and non-dissipative dielectric, we have arrived at a model for a medium that incorporates both dispersion and dissipation. In case of a homogeneous medium, this model can be solved in terms of steady state solutions, which actually diagonalize the Hamiltonian and switching dissipation generates quantum radiation in pairs. The particle yield is of second order in the perturbation. It will usually be comparably small, but might be higher than for other known scenarios. And with this, I'd like to thank for your attention. Thanks to the organizers. And if you're interested in further details, you could have a look at our paper and more work, especially concerning an application of the homogeneous case is currently being prepared. So thanks a lot. Thanks for that presentation, Sasha. It's really very interesting stuff. Well, thank you. and uh, if people from the audience have any questions, please use the, the raise hand button so that I can ask you to unmute yourself and, and then uh, ask your question to, to Sasha. If you can find the, the raise hands button, it's it's enough to just raise hands and release your video. But if there, yes, okay. So there's a question from Cisco. Uh, Hi. Yeah, thank you for that talk. Um, I've been looking to implement similar things in one of the systems I'm working on, what exactly are the advantages of 
using an extra field to model the dissipation. Um, and what are the what are the consistency payoffs that you get from incorporating that structure rather than just say, for instance, estimating uh, the absorption or dissipation through the imaginary component of a permittivity and you know, setting up your quantization based on that? Um, essentially in our system, we are able to set up the whole thing in a Lagrangian picture, which then be can be quantized in a canonical framework. So we have some system parameters, which are already time and or space time dependent in the model and everything just goes through rather smoothly. And I'm not sure how exactly you would accomplish this by just using some effective functions. So you are considering some macroscopic I mean, framework, right? Yeah, I mean, there's there's nothing stopping me from just setting up a, a dispersive quantum field theory with some arbitrary dielectric function that tells me how my um, fields propagate and whatnot. Um, and then, you know, not saying that that permittivity function comes from a field. It just, it's a prescribed dispersion. I could, I could set up a quantum field theory based on that. Um, but w w what are really the, the regimes where I would need to care about modeling that, uh, the dissipation and that dispersion uh, with a field on its own or with a, a full bath of particles or oscillators or whatever? I'm not sure in which regimes exactly your approximation would break down. Um, I think it's, it's rather a question on how you want to model this kind of stuff. Historically, using this um, effective permittivity function essentially stems from this Hutner Barnard approach, who actually did the whole calculation and derivation for a medium with those harmonic oscillators. And if you do this, you arrive at some rather lengthy expression, which you then somehow need to interpret as the dielectric permittivity of this medium. The drawback of this is that this lengthy expression for the permittivity is not really useful for later calculations. And for this reason, people have just replaced this function coming out of a medium by some effective function they assume to be empirically given. But if you now want to study time dependence of this function. So in principle, okay. if you wanted to do this in a canonical framework, you should start from some model with a Lagrangian, with a Hamiltonian and carry out this whole discussion. And that's okay. not really possible for this Hutner-Barnett type model. Okay, so uh, am I correct to interpret that that kind of is the difference between like a back reacting or a non back reacting situation. So if, if your fields propagating through the material alter the dielectric to like add time dependence to its structure, then you need to, for consistency, you need to model it with fields or a, a, a bath of particles mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah, is that, somehow is that generally. Somehow this should be the difference. Because in your case, okay. you probably don't have explicitly this matter field, you just have this permittivity function mainly. So yeah, obviously in our case, you have all those effects somehow included in the theory. Of course, in the limitations of the model we make, but in principle it's there and you can extract the quantum dynamics if you're interested in and eventually can solve the integrals or whatever's left. Okay. But you Thank don't you. need additional assumptions. So maybe just uh, my impression is that, uh, I mean, I agree that we, when you have back reaction, then, then it's crucial. But in a sense, the, the fact that you want to incorporate dissipation is also uh, very important. And also sort of historically, uh, whenever one wanted to consider quantum dissipation, namely quantum systems with dissipation, Historically, at the very beginning, people try to find ways to modify, you know, quantum mechanics uh, to describe the usual treatment of quantum mechanics to describe dissipation. But then, you know, there were inconsistencies and so on. And in the end, the lesson that was learned is that typically the best way to do that 
was that you actually consider a, a bigger closed quantum system that evolves uniquely yeah. usual and then you just then focus on a subsystem and then explain dissipation and so on just because of the fact that you restrict it to a subsystem and that's how one could then describe everything consistently. Of course, the dynamics of the subsystem is non-unitary in general, you would have dissipation, but historically, in a sense, there was this similar process that uh, one tried to incorporate dissipation in quantum mechanical systems, and in the end, the best way to do it was in fact considering the bigger picture of a closed quantum system, standard description, and then restricting to the subsystem, uh, which then exhibited this kind of dissipation and other related effects. And somehow, um, what here is exactly that. I mean, this, this yeah, okay. Maybe historically, could, could you possibly comment on historically what when were those inconsistencies really problematic? Because I mean, in, if your dissipation is small, you can just uh, you know, incorporate an imaginary component of your dielectric function and see decay of your, for instance, optical fields or whatever. Um, so, when do you get into trouble historically, like just in general? I mean, I think you, you can go back to, I would say, in the early 80s, uh, you know, in a sense, for example, there was this work in the context of also superconductivity and trying to look at quantum phenomena and superconductors by uh, Leggett. And so these Caldera Leggett models that were some of these were uh, this quantum Brownian motion that had already been investigated much earlier, but really there in some more detail was really as a sort of trying to do in a more consistent way what others slightly before that uh, were trying to do this uh, quantization of or incorporating dissipation in quantum mechanical systems. I don't know, you can try to trace back some of those references like Ambi Gauker and some of those in the, I would say, in the very early 80s. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Thanks for the question, Cisco. And uh, thanks for the answer, Sasha, and, and the comments, Albert. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? OK, in that case, then let's thank Sasha again. Let me pause the recording. Now we head into the, the fourth contributed talk of this uh, last session of the R2Y online. So Stefano Virali is here from the Polytechnique Montreal. Um, and he will be talking about how to probe quantum states of the electromagnetic field locally in space time. So Steph Stefan, sorry, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Sorry for that. Well that's all right thank you very much uh, rick and um before i start i would like to uh thank you rick and uh, thank eduardo for um I, i'm going to be the last speaker he's not a, an organizer so i'd like to um thank you very much for organizing this very very nice uh, series of uh, conferences and um i think we learned a lot and i think the format is really ideal because uh, Everybody has enough time to speak and, and then questions can be answered thoroughly. So I think it's, uh, it was really uh, well organized and, and a very interesting conference. So thank you very much. With that said, uh, I will present myself. I'm uh, Stéphane Virali. I'm working um, in Polytechnic Montreal uh, in the laboratory of uh, Professor Denis Selesky. I'm a research um, fellow. And um, we work on uh, ultra-fast optics, uh, and my specialty is uh, ultra-fast quantum optics. Um, so I like to, to think about um, optics in, in the time domain and not in the frequency domain, which will feature heavily in my talk. So um, the, the, the title of the talk is Probing the Quantum States of the EM Field Locally in Space Time, and we will see that local is very important for us. So the first thing I'd say, is, I'd like to say is uh, we have heard a lot about uh, UNRWA with detectors in, uh, in this uh, conference. And usually they're, they're presented as something like a particle in the box or uh, uh, an atom and uh, or a harmonic oscillator, any type of device that, that can uh, absorb um, quanta of uh, the electromagnetic field and um, or emit them. And um, usually they are very, very small. 
in space. That means they are very local, and I guess it's a requirement of those uh, detectors in in most cases because you want to immerse them in a in a curved space time. So you don't want to have to worry about internal things going on with uh, various parts of the of space in, of space time inside the apparatus that would uh, that would curve everything. Uh, the thing is, uh, because they are usually um, talked about as atoms or harmonic oscillators and things like that, they are local in space, but they are not uh, local in time. Um, what I mean by that is that um, they feature discrete levels of, um, of energies. And so the, the light is, is absorbed in quantas of uh, fixed frequencies. And that means in terms of uh, resolution in, if you want to resolve those, those frequencies correctly in, in, in time domain, you have to um, have a relatively long interaction. So in the end, those detectors um, are not that local in space time. Um, and that to me is something that, that is a bit weird. So I would like to instead introduce uh, what I will call uh, Unrudovit um, Fermi golden rule um, detector, something that is really local in space time. That is, it's local in space as all those um, uh, detectors are, but also um, it will also be uh, local in time. And in order to do that, you have to abandon the idea of having a discrete set of, uh, of energies. You have to go for something that is a uh, wide band. And of course the ideal um, candidate in terms of, uh, of uh, theory would be graphene for instance, because it has this direct point where um, any type, any energy can be absorbed. So starting from zero and going to infinity in principle, of course, this is something that will never um, work because of uh, dissipation and, and, um, um, and differences in, in indices uh, of refraction and stuff like that. The, by the way, the talk before me was absolutely excellent. I would like very much to, to talk to those people. They, are, they, are, they, are, they have uh, excellent uh, things to say, I think. Uh, but if we want to, to, um, to model this uh, wide band detector, we might not want to go to graphene. We might, we might want to go to something a little bit more uh, uh, realistic with a gap. Uh, so maybe a semiconductor or something like that. It doesn't have to be that. We will see uh, uh, an example in a few moments. But the idea would be maybe there's a gap and also there, there, there has to be a cutoff in um, high frequencies. But the idea is that instead of having omega in uh, discrete, discrete levels, uh, we want to have a continuum. And that will really ensure that we are local in space and in time. And uh, uh, instead of having those discrete levels, we want to have that, that continuum. Before um, I continue onto the topic that I will present you afterwards, which is that we have a solution for this, for this problem. I'd like to also add a word on uh, the observables that uh, are usually um, taken into account in those systems. So most of the time we hear about uh, a system that absorbs, uh, for instance, a photon. Um, um, so this uh, is well described by, uh, by Glauber um, as an absorption event will, um, will produce a set of um, finite uh, states. So we'll, we'll, couple the, the, we'll, we'll couple the initial state to final states. And it's the sum of all those, um, um, of those contributions that we, that we must take into account to, to, to get the, the final probability of having an absorption. And if you, if you think that the, the number of final states is large enough that it's almost like the identity you get to this expression, which means that basically an absorption event is the measurement of that uh, observable uh, or A dagger A, which is a, an observable because it's a, a Hermitian. And, um, and that's why we usually talk about 
numbers of photons in terms of this observable. Of course, there are other mechanisms that we can take into account and uh, it's been seen already in the literature, of course. Uh, we can instead think about something that would be stimulated emission. So it would be the reverse and it would lead to a term uh, A, A dagger. And this has a, the particularity that it's A dagger A plus one. So it means that this uh, phenomenon can be induced actually by the vacuum. So it's already a distinction uh, with the absorption case. And I think if you want to really uh, measure everything in the uh, electric field, you have to, to, to measure all those terms and not just, for instance, absorption. You really have to, to, to take into account A and A dagger. And there's a nice candidate for that, which is um, the so-called quadratures of the electric field. So A dagger plus A and I A dagger minus A. And they're usually thought about uh, in terms of experiment as uh, stemming from homodyne de detection. So you, you mix a local oscillator with your field and uh, you can measure um, directly one of those quadratures or both of them if you change the phase. And the problem is that now we're, we're talking about um, time domain and uh, homodyne detection with that local oscillator, which is a single frequency, um, is not a good picture. So um, the question is, what do you do when you want to measure those quadratures uh, locally in time? And um, this is a shameless plug to uh, um, a PRA that um, I wrote in 2019. I will just give you the gist of it. I don't want to go too, too heavily into the details because I want you to read the paper. Um, but the, the idea is that uh, the, the Hamiltonian is only um, proportional to the, to, to the number plus, uh, number plus one um, operator in frequency domain. In time domain, it's not true because uh, you usually, um, the Hamiltonian is really measuring the uh, E and B field and you measure the energy by uh, adding the, 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 the square of those, the squares of those fields. But of course you have those uh, uh, square root of H bar omega inside of the integrals. So it's not the same thing as the uh, quadratures, which are really A dagger A plus A A dagger which were, which are Q squared plus P squared and not E squared and B squared. They don't have those uh, square root of H bar omega in them. And so they are not exactly the same object. And uh, they are not proportional to one another. So you cannot have a, a proportionality, uh, a direct pro proportionality between H and the number if you want in time domain. So if you go uh, a little bit further in the analysis, you will realize that uh, the, the real quadratures in, in time domain can be obtained by transforms of the, um, of the electric field, for instance, or the, of the, or the B field. Um, but those transforms are non-causal. So there's a non-causal relation between, uh, um, between the observables of electric field and, and, uh, and the B field. Um, with respect to the quadratures. In addition, uh, if you want to, to, to think about quadratures in, in, in the more larger scheme of things, um, sorry, the, um, the idea is that you reply, replace the quadratures by, by a pair of uh, Hilbert, um, uh, of Hilbert observables. So P and Q are Hilbert transform of one another which is also Hilbert transform is also a non-causal transform. So it's an interesting feature and you can make a, a combinations if you want a, a rotation in the, in the space of those uh, quadratures, a rotation between Q and P and you get, if you, if you do the correct combination, you can have something that is purely causal. So it's purely coming from uh, uh, the electric field in the past, but some, and, and the orthogonal quadrature would be purely a causal. That means it comes completely from the future. So I think that's an interesting uh, idea to keep in mind that it's the, 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 the measurement of a photon, a click, which is really a click on a detector, 
would uh, kind of mix those two things coming from the, the future and from the past. Now I come to the, um, to the meat of my presentation, which is we want to do to measure these, uh, these things in, in time domain. And uh, we have a perfect candidate for this. And uh, it was actually introduced in this conference, well, in the Australian part of this conference by Sho Onoe in, uh, maybe it was fe February or March, I don't remember exactly. Um, but uh, the idea is to use electro-optic sampling. And electro-optic sampling is really something that mixes two um, EM fields at two in two um, domains of frequencies. And one is the, is the one under stu study. So for instance, in general, uh, so far, we've been able to measure terahertz fields. And the way we do that is by mixing it with a probe in the uh, near infrared. And this probe has a very large frequency content. So it's, uh, it's very wide in frequency. And so it's very narrow in time. And actually the condition for proper uh, measurement here is that the uh, width, the time width of this, uh, of this blue, uh, no, sorry, of this green pulse uh, has to be less than half of a wavelength of the uh, of the field that you're that you're studying. So the idea is you mix them in a, in a, in a nonlinear crystal, and uh, that changes the uh, the slightly the the polarization state of the probe, the, the green uh, the green pulse, and then you do uh, detection in a ellipsometric um, apparatus, and you can measure directly the electric field of the uh, of the terahertz field. In addition, it is really something that is uh, local in space and time because you can focus tightly and you can, uh, and you can have a thin crystal. And uh, of course you have this uh, very thin uh, slice of time that, that is probed by the, by, by the near infrared uh, pulse. So uh, everything is really tight in space and time. It's a small space time uh, volume. And this has also very good, um, it, it, it helps a lot because uh, the uh, fluctuations of the electric field, even in the vacuum, um, are proportional to the inverse of the, of the space time volume or actually the square root of the space time volume. So if you have a very, very tight and very small space time volume, you have a lot of fluctuations. And that's what enabled uh, a group in constants uh, from which uh, Dennis, my, the professor I work uh, for um, stems from, uh, they, they published this uh, very nice paper about the, the, the measurement of the fluctuations of the, uh, of the EM field um, of the EM vacuum. So I urge you to, to, to read also that paper. Um, so now if, if we talk about the observables of this uh, E field, um, the, the, of the of the EOS, it's the E field. So it has uh, two parts. One part is the uh, absorption part, and the, and the other part would be the creation part. And they stem from two uh, different uh, phenomena inside the uh, inside the crystal. One is a difference frequency generation, where you absorb a photon of the probe, and then you create uh, a photon of the probe at a slightly smaller frequency and also a, a photon in the, in the field that you're studying and some frequency generation, which is the, the opposite. So those represent the two, the two parts of the, uh, of the field. And they are both playing a role in US, which is a, a great thing. Um, uh, the only problem, morning. yes, thank you very much. So, um, the, 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 the problem we have is that uh, US is very hard to perform. And uh, it's hard to perform, be, first of all, because you have to have the right conditions. You have to be able to, to generate those very uh, uh, short pulses. And this already takes a lot of, uh, of uh, know-how, uh, but also because if you want to measure things like uh, the vacuum, the quantum vacuum, you really have to work very hard to figure out the signal from, from the noise. And uh, this is an example taken from that very same uh, paper um, where it shows the difference between the 
uh, before and after, if you want, um, uh, with and without a signal, with, with and without the vacuum. It's difficult to think about the fact that there's no vacuum, but there's a way to do that by expanding the, 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 the space-time volume so as to remove the fluctuations of the vacuum. So basically the idea is that there's a difference between with and without those fluctuations, but this difference is very, very small. It's, it, it's about four or 5% of, uh, of the total noise that you see. So it's, it's very difficult to, to extract. So we want to do something a little bit uh, easier. And the idea we had is uh, instead of uh, using the classical probe that everybody uses, we add more quantumness to, to the problem. The idea is that the classical probe that we use is a, it's just a co coherent state and it's uh, limited by its shot noise and it has its own inherent uh, limitations. We want to be able to do something a little bit better. So the idea is to replace that classical probe by a non-classical one. And we obtain that non-classical gate by uh, a first uh, nonlinear process, a spontaneous parametric down conversion, which creates two branches of uh, two modes uh, that, can, that can be separate, uh, separated uh, specially but they're entangled in photon numbers. So the idea is you go, if you, if you just take one of those branches, you would see a, a thermal distribution instead of uh, the, uh, the one that the coherent, uh, the coherent state has. Um, and, if you, and using that branch uh, in, the upper, um, in the upper level here, you can condition the, the, the probe, you can condition the number of photons in the probe. So you can sli uh, uh, create slices uh, or bands in that, in that uh, probability distribution. And that enables us to create states that are uh, completely quantum in nature and that will provide us with more information about the, um, the field under study. So I just show you, uh, to, to, to prove my case that uh, we, we introduce actually a, a real quantumness, I just show you uh, Wigner distributions of those, uh, of those states. This is the coherent state. This is only the first qu quadrant of the Wigner distribution. So it's just a, a, a Gaussian in, two, in 2D. We all know the, about that. Uh, this is the thermal state that you get if you don't do any conditioning. But if you do the conditioning, the band that I showed you before, you get a very nice Wigner distribution with um, negative values. So you're sure that you have a, you have a, a quantum state. And actually it shows in the, uh, in the results that we, that we have simulated, because if you use this very nice uh, state instead of the coherent state, you can get much better uh, signal to noise if you want resolution in, um, in the system. So here, this is the, the type of changes that you can expect uh, in the number of photons detected um, in EOS uh, with, the, with the coherent gate. And this is with the, our, our scheme, which we call BCS for band condition states. Uh, so we have almost a, an order of magnitude of improvement in terms of uh, signal to noise, if you want. And that enables us to, to, to consider other things than just the vacuum. We can consider cat states and we have very uh, neat features that we, that we can uh, probe with our, with our um, new uh, states. In particular, what we can do, and this will be my uh, last slide. Uh, um, what we can do is um, decouple all the, uh, the moments of the uh, distribution of the electric field. And in the final uh, curve, that, curve that we get, we have different susceptibilities to all those different moments of the, uh, of the distribution of the electric field. So we can separate them very nicely uh, with different schemes. For instance, this one takes uh, a, a low band and a high band, and it has uh, these very peculiar shapes. And, uh, and we, can, we can reconstruct the, the, the full statistics 
or, or as much as we can of the statistics of the electric field and not just the, the first or second moment. So we, we, we truly think that with this, we can, we can uh, expand the, 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 the measurements to things that are not as simple, if I can say, as the vacuum, uh, but more, more complicated states like a cat state. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank you very much again for uh, your attention and uh, I'm open to your questions. Thank you, Stefan, for this very nice presentation. Also, let me use this opportunity to thank you for your kind words in the beginning. Uh, we really appreciate Welcome. It's that the, the conference being enjoyable. Yes. Uh, all right, so if you have any questions for Stefan, please use the, the, rand, uh, the raise hand button so that I can give you the board. Well, it looks like we don't have any questions uh, for the, the very last contributed talk. In, in any case, Sorry. Stefan, uh, <laughs> thank you so much for your talk. And uh, let me pause. Oh, yeah, let, let's thank you again for your contribution. Thank you. And uh, let me pause the recording then so that we can head into the last talk. Mm. So now we move on to the, the last talk of the RQI Online 2020 21 uh, conference. It will be delivered by one of the, the organizers, Eduardo Martin Martinez. Uh, he's from the University of Waterloo, and he will tell us a tale of particles and measurements. So please, Eduardo, the floor is all yours. All right. So um, thank you very much. It's been, it's been a pleasure to organize uh, this talk. And uh, honestly, uh, uh, we are both Thales and I and, and everybody else in both um, are really happy with how it worked for an online conference. Um, I'm gonna give a little bit of, uh, so rather than focusing on a very full of research results talk, I'm gonna delve into some of the things that we've been discussing during the conference, those related to, um, to measuring uh, models for measurements and uh, how to characterize a measurement theory in QFT. A little bit of a review, a little bit of hopefully a more fun talk. Uh, uh, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Let me first mention uh, that things that I'm gonna mention here that are part of uh, research that I've done, I've done in collaboration with uh, these people. These are uh, students of mine or former students of mine. Uh, some of them you would recognize because I don't know, maybe they've been organizing the conference and you know some others may not. Many of them have already talked in this conference. So just uh, giving them a big acknowledgement because um, without, without these people, this research would not exist. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the measurement problem, a little bit of a review on things that have been, have been said already. And uh, of course, emphasizing that the measurement problem in quantum mechanics, even without talking about relativity, is still an open problem. Huh? So it's not a thing that I can tell you, oh yeah, this is the solution to the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. So let me just uh, give a little bit of, uh, I mean, we all know this, but just, here's a proposal that it's probably reasonable. At least some measurements can give values, right? For example, you measure a physical quantity, you expect to get a value, say 42, that you can write somewhere on a notepad. Okay, and experimentalists can store that data. In quantum mechanics, we model the measurements that give and how they update right, uh, uh, the state of the system that give you a definite value of an observables with idealized measurements. Idealized measurements of non-degenerate observables update the state through a rank one projector on the spectrum of the measure observables. Okay, this is the textbook rule, Luther's rule for the update of states. But then what about, how does that work? How, I mean, when I talk here about quantum to classical, I don't mean how classicality emerges out of a very macroscopic system. I mean, I have a probability distribution that is intrinsically probabilistic, doesn't come from a hidden variable theory. I make a measurement and now I know for sure that I have a definite value, that's what I mean. And how do we interpret this? Well, here's the thing. If you're not into foundations, you can just not care and still become very rich and famous in physics. That's not gonna stop you. So it's okay for many people. Again, re-emphasizing, still an open problem. Things get a little bit worse as we have heard here when we talk about QFT, right? Relativity makes it tougher. 
So maybe we want to measure localized observables of a quantum field, say the electric field in my room during the duration of my talk. That seems like a reasonable thing to measure. And if you measure it, it's not unthinkable that you get a definite reading, like say 42 volts per meter. That is a reasonable reading. Cool. Question here is, can you become rich and famous just doing idealized measurements in QFT? Well, one of the things we've discussed is that Rafael Sorkin told us in the 90s, mm, there seems to be a problem. I mean, I'm not going to delve into the abstract. Let me just illustrate with the two examples that uh, Rafael Sorkin gives. He first says, OK, think of a two qubit system and consider a state like that one, 0 a, 0 b. OK, then Sorkin says, OK, perform a local unitary on a. And then after that, make an idealized bell measurement projecting on that bell state that you see there. Then Sorkin says, well, the expectation of observables, local observables uh, on B gain information about the unitary perform on A. And then probably many people would say, well, I'm not surprised, right? Because you're doing a non-local measurement. The measurement is non-local. You're projecting over something non-local. So of course, I mean, you're doing some non-local operation there. Then Rafael Sorkin said, OK, now consider a state of a quantum field, some state row of a quantum field, then perform a local unitary on a field observable localized around A, then do an idealized non-local projective measurement on a horizontal slice of space-time, and then the expectation of local observables on B gain information about the unitary on A. There's a problem. And uh, if you look naively uh, at it, you say, OK, maybe the problem is that this projection is very non-local, right? I mean, that is enabling superluminal signaling. Can we solve this issue by disallowing two non-local kinds of measurements? So even though maybe that's something that can be suggested by reading the paper, uh, the fact is that no. I mean, uh, this, uh, this has been discussed lengthily. Uh, and there's this uh, paper called Impossible Measurements Revisited that I totally recommend you read where they discuss that, no, this problem of impossible measurements you get even if you localize your projective measurements. So there's a problem with idealized measurements of the, the operational way of describing, even if the measurement problem is not resolved in quantum mechanics, the operational way of treating it is not good for QFT. So how do we, how do we proceed? Because people doing quantum optics do measurements all the time and, and, and they update things like that. And what, what's the deal with it? So what, what's going on? So let me take a step back and, uh, and ask something that Jose Polo mentioned already in the talk. What are, what, what are the features that I want for a measurement theory in QFT? If I want a measurement theory, what do I have to demand? Well, I want it to be capable of producing definite values. I want to be able to write down in my notepad a 42, for example. So I want to be single shot. I want to allow for single shot measurements that give me a value. I want an update rule. Uh, by that, I mean, I need to know what happens to the measure system after the measure is performed so that there's compatibility with future measurements. Okay, that is what, that's, what the reason, that's the reason why the Luders rule was introduced, like the projective measurement rule was introduced because you need to make measurements in the future consistent with measurements in the past. So we need an update rule. Now, of course, we need it to be consistent with the theory. And if this is a QFT, we need it to be consistent with the relativistic aspect of the theory. For example, causality. Not only, but that's an example. And of course, we want it to be modeling realistic measurements. We want whatever the measurement theory is, we want it to be able to say, OK, this is what this experimentalist is doing. And this is modeled by this. We need a relationship between what an experimenter does and uh, the value uh, that you get, that, and the theoretical treatment of that measurement. So is there an alternative to idealized measurements? Well, we've seen several. Uh, we've, uh, we've talked, uh, we've seen uh, Chris Fuster uh, um, and Max Rueb and uh, talking about the Fuster Verge formalism uh, framework, if you want. And uh, we've also seen in this, uh, in this conference uh, particle detectors all the time. There have been many talks that use particle detectors. Let's look at the particle detector approach before going back to maybe more general discussions. So let's have some fun. Because uh, when we talk particle detectors, this is fun. This, this was inspired by, uh, I, I got a referee one telling me, uh, the name particle detector is wrong. You shouldn't use it for the Android with detector because it can't click in the vacuum and there are no particles there. Uh, and this inspired me to discuss a little bit what we call, what we call vac uh, particles, because maybe high energy physicists would have a very different idea than people working 
in um, in uh, RQI, for example, or at least some people, or at least me. I don't know. So let's see. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about. Uh, so there's there's of course this old paper by David Malament. Uh, it's called In Defense of Dogma. What a title uh, for a scientific article. But the, the defense, it, it, there's a reason why that title is there. So it's why there cannot be a relativistic quantum mechanics of localizable particles. Uh, very, uh, it's one of the of the first relevant papers to the question that I, I'm gonna I'm, I'm asking here of what is a particle. Basically, it's proven that uh, a relativistic quantum mechanics is inconsistent. Uh, you cannot be localized, you cannot be relativistic, and you cannot be quantum mechanical the three at the same time. But let me go to a more fun, maybe, paper uh, to read. Uh, so I recommend, this is, uh, this is Willis Lamb that you may know from many things. Willis Lamb is, uh, you know, you know that everybody knows the Lamb shift. Um, uh, Lamb had a lot, won a no the Nobel Prize in 1955, talking about atomic spectra. I mean, Lamb certainly is somebody to ask about atoms and matter and the light matter interaction and see what he thinks. And, uh, he also did a lot of work in the foundations of uh, QFT in, and the light matter interaction. So he's got this paper in 1991 called Antiphoton. So the paper has an abstract that is long. We're gonna read it slowly, okay? We're gonna read it phrase by phrase. So he starts the abstract saying, it should be apparent from the title of this article that the author does not like the use of the word photon, which dates from 1926. In his view, there is no such thing as a photon. Then he says, only a comedy of errors and historical accidents led to its popularity among physicists and optical scientists. I admit that the word is short and convenient. Its uses also have it forming. Similarly, then he talks, one might find it convenient to speak of the ether or vacuum to stand for empty space, even if no such thing existed. There are very good substitute words for photon, e.g. radiation or light, and for photonics, e.g. optics or quantum optics. Similar objections are possible to the use of the word phonon, which dates from 1932. And this is the important bit. Electron neutrinos of finite rest mass, helium atoms or helium atoms can, under suitable conditions, be considered to be particles, since their theories then have viable non-relativistic and non-quantum limits. And this is what I want to insist. The rest of the abstract basically talks about what it's going to do in the, in the paper. But this is the key point. In order to be able to talk about something that has some localization in the sense of what we expect from a particle, something that is localized in some way, uh, it is important that we have non-relativistic and non-quantum limits. Of course, the electromagnetic field doesn't have a non-relativistic limit. Um, just for fun, the, this is from the same paper. <laughs> Lam was really giving it all. Uh, that summary, that summary, it says it's high time to give up the use of the word photon and of a bad concept which we saw be a century old. Radiation does not consist of particles. And the classical, i.e., non quantum limit of the quantum theory of radiation is described by Maxwell's equations for the electromagnetic fields, which do not involve particles. Talking about radiation in terms of particles is like using such ubiquitous phrases as, you know, or I mean, which are very much to be heard in some cultures for a friend of Charlie Brown, it might serve as a kind of security blanket. So I totally recommend that you read this paper. Um, very, very interesting, but certainly it's pointing out something that the notion of particle is not a notion that it's well-defined when we want to operate with relativity and quantum theory. Now we go to Villandru, Villandru and Wald, both told us, Villandru tells us every, every day, every time, and, uh, and uh, they wrote a 1984 paper with Wald, very nice paper to read about uh, uh, accelerated detectors and this notion of Rindler quanta and so on. Well, the thesis that we take when we use the particle detector approach is saying particles are what particle detectors detect. And what are particle detectors? Particle detectors are non relativistic quantum systems that can couple locally to the field with some features that we demand from them. But that's what we're going to call particle detectors. See, I mean, this is, that's the way we measure quantum fields. We don't measure quantum fields um, uh, out of just uh, getting projectors on observables of the field. We do couple our retinas in our eyes. We couple our photo detectors. Uh, the LHC has sensors that couple to the electromagnetic field and CCDs, and those are the ones that carry out the measurements on quantum fields. So whether you like it or not, it's a well-defined way of uh, defining the notion of particle. Now we've seen a lot about the Andrew DeWitt detector model. 
I'm not going to talk much about it. Uh, we already know that uh, this here for a stationary detector in the quantization frame, we see that we identify some switching in time of the interaction, some spatial smearing of the interaction, some internal degree of freedom that couples to the quantum field. We've seen that already a lot. Now, let's see how this detector model stands when confronted with these four requirements that I laid out we need for a measurement theory. And let's begin with four, which is uh, not to be neglected, reproduce experiments. So I'm gonna give you something very crude, but I'll point you to the references where this is done more properly. Now, is this model just a toy? Let me give you something really simple and then I'll discuss, I'll just mention a little bit of the complications. Um, let's see if it can model the dipole coupling of an atom with the electromagnetic field. Okay, so imagine that this D is the dipole operator of an electron in an atom. And uh, this is basically EX. Uh, and then we get this, this dipole coupling Hamiltonian. Uh, let's reduce it to two levels. I mean, we can have many levels. That's not a problem. Under the weight detectors are not two level systems. There also could be harmonic oscillators. There could be many things. Okay, under the weight detectors is kind of the generic way in which we call linear couplings of some internal degree of freedom of a non-relativistic system with the electron, well, with some quantum field. All right, so we write it, uh, we write, uh, we reduce, uh, say we're looking at two orbitals, one S and two P and something like that. And then we do we insert a couple of uh, spectral decomposition of identity here. And by doing so, we end up with this form uh, of the dipole Hamiltonian, dipole coupling Hamiltonian, where F is given. So where is the shape of this in a very idealized uh, uh, setup, what is the shape of this detector? Well, it's given by the excited and the ground state wave functions. That's a smearing vector right there. And then we can define a dipole operator and that dipole operator allows us to write the Hamiltonian in this position representation that I have as this form. This is the dipole coupling. Now, of course, we can compare with the Andrew DeWitt model and we quickly see that the Andrew DeWitt model is the monopole version. They simplify, okay, let's not, Let's forget about the vector nature of the field. Uh, let's look at uh, the, what is the fundamental structure of the coupling. Let's write a monopole version. And that monopole version is what has been known as the Andrew DeWitt model. Now, there's a lot of, of work that uh, we've done relating the light matter interaction with Andrew DeWitt models and, and exploring different regimes and, and so on. Uh, maybe the last one, because what I presented to you is pretty pedestrian, let's say. There's many issues. So electromag electromagnetic fields are gauge fields. So it's a gauge theory. Uh, how are gauge issues? Do gauge issues actually make the, the reduction to a simplified problem non-trivial and so on? And it does. In fact, LAMB uh, work on these things as well. Um, here's some, if you want to read the latest one, uh, that would give you a good summary. Uh, the latest one looks into all these issues that I'm just kind of sweeping under the carpets uh, in order to tell you that the end of the weight model it, it is reproducing the light matter interaction, but I'm gonna make that claim. The Android Wind model captures all the fundamental features of the light matter interaction, perhaps except for exchange of angular momentum, of course, well, perhaps without the exchange of angular momentum, of course, if you consider a scalar model, but it's not that difficult to work with the electromagnetic under the weight if you want, which is the dipole coupling. Anyhow, yeah, that's the one that I recommended to read. Of course, uh, let me just write a more generic scalar field under the weight coupling. Of course, it's not related. It's not necessarily reduced to two levels. Huh? So just keep that in mind. It would be an internal degree of freedom of the field, and that could be anything, that internal other field of the detector, and that could be any degree of freedom of the detector that can couple um, linearly to the quantum field. All right, cool. So hopefully I've argued enough, and we'll see if you have questions about it, uh, that the under the weight model does reproduce experiments. In fact, as I said, uh, mentioned in a slide before, uh, the common models that quantum optics uses are further simplifications over the Andrew DeWitt. Okay, so what about the consistency with the theory? Of course, this is something concerning, right? Because it's a non-relativistic quantum system coupling to uh, um, a relativistic quantum field. So is it consistent with the theory? Can we formulate in a way that's consistent with the theory? But there are two things to care about. There's the general covariance of the model. So if I couple this system, do I get general covariance? And uh, the other one, more importantly, perhaps, well, or different. They, they are, they're not unrelated, but they're different issues, uh, which is the, the no FTL signal, like no faster than light signal or no retrocausality, right? So this one, general covariance, Thales talked about, Rick talked about. Uh, you can check about, um, about uh, the, the, you know, these two papers with Thales and Bruno. Uh, let me just give you a tiny bit 
of, uh, of an intro to the part that uh, Thales talked less about in the, in the talk. So imagine that I have a, an n plus one dimensional curve space, okay? Uh, so a manifold space and manifold uh, M equipped with a metric G. So a scalar field in that one, very, very well. So consider a foliation, then we have a time like vector partial T, and then we have the space-like surfaces uh, per, uh, perpendicular, if you want, uh, to that partial T, where every, uh, every slice is a Cauchy surface. Now, the constant time surface allows us to introduce equal time commutation relations and canonical conjugate momentum, and we can do canonical quantization to the field in that curved space time. Now, how do we introduce uh, an Andrew Dewey detector in this context and how we make it covariant? We are used to talking about the Andrew Dewey detector in terms of a switching and a smearing. But of course, if we've been covariant, even in flat space time, that's just an observer dependent thing, right? What is the switching function for somebody? Maybe a mixture of a switching and a smearing for somebody else. So even a point light detector that goes on a time like trajectory, somebody else may say, okay, but maybe that switching function that switches it on is got some kind of spatial dependence and vice versa, same thing would go with a smearing function. So before we introduce the notion of switching and smearing, let me switch to something else called this lambda space-time smearing. That tells you the points in space-time, the events at which the interaction is switched on. And I have here a Hamiltonian uh, interaction density okay, that describes the interaction at every point in space-time. And you see you have this internal degree of freedom of the detector that has to depend on the proper time. This Tx is the foliation we, we use to describe uh, the interaction here. And we have the field. And uh, instead of picking a very weird uh, quantization frame, let me pick, let me quantize the field, as I said before, in that using this foliation that I have for space time. Now, uh, the map that maps the detector and field state from an in initial state in a Cauchy surface to a final state in another Cauchy surface is given by this expression, the time order exponential of the space-time integral of this Hamiltonian density. Now, of course, this thing is foliation independent. The exponential of that, as you can tell, this thing is invariant and the change of foliation. So, of course, this exponential has the notion of the interaction is covariantly prescribed if we do this. So different people in different frames would not disagree on what that exponential is, are doing different foliation. Okay, so now uh, let's build a detector because you see this is like kind of quite yet related to the Android detector that we all use. Let's uh, let's do let's uh, do a couple. Let's take a couple of assumptions on the space time smearing. So consider tau psi be Fermi normal coordinates around the trajectory of the detector and the trajectory of the cent what I would call the center of mass of the detector. What is that? Center of mass of the detector is just one point in the space space time in the space time support of the detector. One point that I take that goes on a time-like trajectory. And I call that, I single that one out and call it the center of mass because I want to. Now, the proper distance uh, between the, this trajectory, the center of mass and any point of coherence thick psi is actually given by the norm of the spatial vector psi, which is nice. And now this is, uh, this is the assumption, uh, one key assumption, the Fermi-Walker rigidity. So in the proper frame of the detector, think of an atom at rest, we demand, that this detector has internal coherence forces. So these internal coherence forces kind of keep it approximately rigid in uh, the Fermi-Walker frame that moves with the center of mass. And in that frame in particular is the frame that we demand that the space-time smearing can be decomposed as a product of a switching function and a smearing function. So what we're saying with this detector is like, there is a privileged frame, which is the moving frame of the detector in which somebody can control the interaction I know how long I've been interacting and I know, I know how big I am as, as looked by myself. I don't care what the world says. This is what I am. This is how much I interact and how strongly, and this is where I am and where I live. So uh, of course there would be then a frame in which in that frame, in the proper frame of the detector, you get that the Hamiltonian density has this form can be decomposed into space and time smearing functions. And, uh, and that uh, is related to the way we usually set up the Andrew DeWitt detector. Of course, to get the Hamiltonian, and this is important, the Andrew DeWitt Hamiltonian, uh, with respect to different time parameters, we just need to integrate, you, you just need to make a foliation <laughs> in the new, consistent with the new parameters. And then the Hamiltonian is just the space time integral of this Hamiltonian density. And this is fully covariant. This is a mistake that sometimes you see when people use uh, particle detectors moving in different states of motion. Um, because of course, if I have two detectors that move in different states of motion, 
when I give you the Hamiltonian of one of them in its proper frame and the Hamiltonian of one of them in its proper frame, well, they don't share a common proper frame, the two center of masses. So if you want to write the Hamiltonian consistently, you have to pick one time parameter and integrate the Hamiltonian densities with respect to uh, the uh, space time in the space or space in the foliation corresponding to the one that you pick for describing the system. And that means that no, the total interaction Hamiltonian is not the sum of the two interaction Hamiltonians. They will be, if they're Poiler detectors, redshift factors of difference. If you have funny space times and distributions, well, the differences are, are wild, are, are actually more different. So that's something to keep in mind that most people do write, but sometimes you see it, that people consider detectors in different states of motion. So just write the sum of the two Hamiltonians. Well, something to be careful about if you care about relativity. And that changes the predictions a lot, of course. Anyway. Uh, so the Hamiltonian generated translations with respect to the center of mass proper time, we can pick this T prime to be tau, has this form. And this is the generalization to arbitrary space times and trajectories of the Henry Witt model that we know. Okay, It's got this common, this known form, if you want, only in the uh, center of mass frame, in the Fermi-Walker frame uh, that goes in the trajectory of the center of mass of the detector. All right. So... The nice thing, though, is that the unitary operator that is the exponential of that is Cornet transformation invariant. So this thing, uh, yeah, the predictions that you get, the time evolution operator, if there were no time ordering here, is the same for any foliations, for any frame. Everybody would agree that the predictions of the envelope detector are the same. As Thales told us, though, time ordering messes that up when the detector is smeared. I'm not going to get into it because Thales talked about it. But basically, the notion of time ordering uh, would yield different results in different frames at second order, well, in the U2, uh, second, order, a second order Dyson expansion contribution to time evolution. Not going to get, again, just mention it, not going to get into it. Thales went uh, well in detail on this. But uh, let's do observations on that result. So in general, if the, if the Hamiltonian density, the interaction Hamiltonian density between the detector and the field is microcosal, then the notion of time order is unambiguous and there's no problem, everything in the model is covariant. So this is the, ca the case if we were to couple to quantum fields and therefore is the case for the fuster bird framework and also the case in high energy physics. So this, uh, this notion that time order is screws up covariance doesn't happen if your interaction is microcosal. That means that the Hamiltonian density commutes with itself in space like separated points. Now, this is also the case for point-like Android with detectors. Even if it's a non-relativistic system, if it's a point-like Android with detector, it is microcosal. The whole thing is covariant. Now, problems of covariance, of course, appear when the detectors are near. It makes sense, right? You have uh, a, a degree of freedom that is seen at the same time, space-like separated points along a world tube. So it is a non-local coupling. So, but the second observation that Thales told us is that if the initial state of the detector is one of the typical ones that are common to use for good reasons, uh, if it commutes with the free Hamiltonian of the detector, then there's no covariance violations as a second order in perturbation theory, which tends to be the leading order for many effects. Wonderful. Even more so, if the field state is Gaussian with zero one point function, so say a thermal state or most vacua, then the violations of covariance start at fourth order not even a third order. And fourth observation, in any other case, when you get those violations, if your under the weight detector motion is not extreme and curvature of space time is not extreme, then the predictions are going to be, and of course, you're not considering frames that are too extreme. So you have access to a finite number of frames that make sense, like your last frame or somebody going really fast, but somebody that you can talk to. Then uh, the predictions are very approximately covariant and the amount of violation of covariant is under control we can perturbatively expand and have it under control. So it's not crazy, it's not, we cannot trust it because it's not covariant, no. We can separate a covariant part and control the covariance violations that appear. So uh, that is uh, was, uh, what Thales told us. Uh, thank you, Thales, for that, much better than I did. So the, the argument that I'm making, after all this, I'm gonna make the argument that covariance is all right with the Andrew DeWitt uh, model. Covariance can be, you can be careful with the Andrew DeWitt model and treat it covariantly. What about FTL signaling? Again, people have talked about it. Uh, so we can talk about if two detectors can superluminal signal. Uh, well, again, no, microcosality of the field implies no FTL signaling between near detectors. 
But then you can ask whether you have a problem like the impossible measurement. What if I have smear detectors? So point light detectors are fine with FTL, I mean, no FTL signaling, no retrocausality. But what about when we allow the detectors to be smeared in the same way that uh, the impossible measurements revisited was uh, talking about projective measurements? Well, in that case, well, as Jose de Ramon, people, by the way, talked about uh, in his talk, uh, the violations of, of causality because of smearing are under control. In particular, same arguments. They don't affect leading order in perturbation theory. And you can actually, they're related to the size of the detector, the parameter of control. And uh, only in the regimes where you actually shouldn't use a detector, as in like for times smaller than the light crossing time of the detector and things like that, you get these issues. So FTL signaling, not a problem at all for point like amrodewi detectors and their control for smear detectors. I added here something that maybe, <laughs> maybe Max will ask, I don't know. I also added, and non-singular if careful enough. <laughs> and also saying that the Android detector is non-singular if careful enough. We can, I'm not gonna get into that. We can discuss it at the end if there are questions. All right, so I discussed the consistency with the theory and I argue that, yeah, it doesn't violate, it doesn't have the problem that projective measurements had, okay? What about capable of producing definite values and giving an update rule? And again, one of the talks of the people that uh, talk about this stuff uh, in the conference. Uh, Jose Polo said, well, yeah, there's an update rule. So if we do an update rule, we get the android detector couples to the field. After it's coupled to the field, we measure the android detector in the usual way. We do an idealized measurement of the detector if I'm gonna get a number 42 out of the outcome of measuring the detector. And that, uh, no, that induces an update rule on the field that respects causality. Wonderful. So there is a way to extract this classical information, which is the outcome of a measurement on the detector without doing something weird to the field and uh, violating all the, or doing all the problems that we had with the impossible measurement with projective measurements directly on the field. The POVM on the field that is induced by the PVM on the detector, it's okay with the relativistic nature of the theory. So before moving, uh, before moving to the next, uh, next step, I would like to argue here that the, the detector model, the Android detector model, it's okay. It's, uh, I'm not saying it's the final model fully fundamental, but it's a good model to implement measurements in QFT. Now, let's talk about something. Uh, it's a paper in preparation. I mean, not, not gonna talk about much about this. It's just a little bit of philosophy to discuss maybe to make it fun about something that uh, uh, we can call the relativistic cut. This is, by the way, with uh, Bruno and, and Dan Grimer. Now, let, let's, let's talk about how do experimentalists get their numbers, okay? So here's the thing. We have a fundamental problem, right? In the sense that we don't know really how to do measurements in quantum fields. Uh, we know that the usual approach in quantum mechanics does not work. So, there is no consistent way of relativistically extract information from a quantum field unless you actually do measurements to something that's non-relativistic. So let, let me put it like this. We're along, we're along the process. If we decide so, we stop modeling the intermediary system as relativistic. I think, okay, we have a system that is a quantum field, a detector that couples. What do I mean by stop modeling as relativistic? I mean, well, of course, I'm not saying that quantum fields are not the fundamental objects. Of course I say that, yeah, I believe that. Quantum fields are the fundamental objects. However, it's not true that to describe the notepad and my pen when I write the number 42, I need relativity for that description. It would be a bit foolish to go to an engineer, you know, I don't know, building an engine and tell them, no, oh, that engine is not gonna work because relativity, they're gonna laugh at you. Similarly, uh, we assume that there should be a point in which it's okay to relax the assumption that the system is relativistic. So of course, uh, what we're doing when we pick the, um, the Andrew DeWitt model is saying, well, it's at the level of the particle detector. We have an object that could be a hydrogen atom that couples to the field. And I'm gonna relax the assumption that this system is relativistic. So at, I, at some point, you know, the measurement data is written down in our effectively classical, effective non-relativistic notepads. So we are justified in taking a relativistic cut somewhere. The Android model just makes it concrete. It says, okay, we're gonna take it at the level of the measurer of the field. Uh, so 
why, why, why so? And why I'm going to argue that this is strong, actually. Well, we have, again, strong theorems telling us that it's not OK to do updates on the field without intermediary systems. And also, downstairs in QFT, somebody would say, well, but atoms also emerge from QFT, right? I mean, atoms in the end would, would appear, would happen in, in quantum field theory. Yeah, but downstairs in QFT are arguably intractable. They're very difficult to deal with. Even if all physical systems are to be described by QFT, one must take a relativistic cut somewhere if you want to model the measurements. Otherwise, we would have no way to solve this relativistic quantum measurement problem, because we know that if it's all quantum fields, we have these problems of violations of causality. We use the, the usual measurement theory formalism. Um, Sorkin argues in different ways. Sorkin would say that um, maybe we should go with consistent histories, but that's a completely different history, if you want. Uh, I would say that there is indeed a measurement theory that can be built out of underwood detectors, not just as some tool that allow us to take measurements, but as something a little bit more way of treating fundamentally the measurement theory of QFT. Now, I'm gonna quote here uh, uh, Chris Fuster uh, in his talk that said, <laughs> you see, because the, the Fusterverse formalism is extremely elegant, I love it. It's an amazing way of uh, doing measurements. The, all, the only assumptions in the Fusterverse formalism are the axioms of QFT. Nobody can argue against them. <laughs> but, uh, but of course, the problem with that is that the detector model, the detector system is actually modeled as a quantum field itself. So there is an assumption that somebody somewhere would be able to extract information from that measurement, uh, sorry, that uh, measurement apparatus quantum field. So someone somewhere knows how to measure something. This is what the under the weight detector is kind of addressing. Yes, we know uh, atomic physicists have been doing this for a long, long time. And these people coupled to the electromagnetic fields and can measure the states of the atom. So we have detectors that we can measure, and PVMs work really well for, for these atomic systems. So the underweight detector, in a way, is not only giving us a tool to just model how measurements are done. I would argue that it's a physical measurement theory for QFT as well. Yeah, not saying anything bad about the Fusterberg's formalism is great. It's just not solving, I would claim, not solving the quantum measurement problem in the sense that it's just prolonging the relativistic cut somewhere else, right? This is an analogy to the Heisenberg cut for the, <laughs> for the useful measurement problem. Anyway, just to summarize uh, before, I don't want to make this long. Again, it's a bit of a brief summary of this discussion about measurements, foundations in, 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 uh, in RQI related to measuring quantum fields. Particle detectors are non-relativistic quantum systems. Idealized measurements on the detector after the coupling, you definitely values. The update rule is respectful with causality. So particle detectors are realistic ways also of modeling the measurement of quantum fields, reproduce experiments, they reproduce quantum optics models. Um, singularity, covariance, and causality of the models is well under control or, or not even a problem, depending on what's, uh, what you're working with. If one can tolerate restrictions of the regimes of applicability, of course, because you know uh, there are no atoms if in times that are below the light crossing time of the atom, right? In the sense that, uh, the electron needs to know that there's something there. Uh, if we allow that there may be some limits to what we can measure in that sense, then we have a valid measurement theory with all undesired effects controlled, characterized, and under a threshold. Outside of those regimes, of course, maybe it doesn't even make sense to talk about localized measurements, I would argue, because what, what is it that makes a localized measurement below the regimes where an atom can exist? How do we do that? Well, something to talk about, right? Anyway, I think that's, uh, that's it for the talk. So I'm gonna just let you ask questions if you have any, and then maybe I'll say a couple of things about the conference. Th thank you. Thank you, Adam, for this very fun talk. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, if anyone has any, any uh, questions uh, uh, regarding this, this talk uh, before we actually uh, uh, say some words to, to end the conference, please. Yes, okay. Uh, ready to see a, a, a question from, from Rob. So please. Hello, Rob. Yeah. Hi, uh, Eduardo. Yeah, very uh, entertaining and interesting. Um, but <clears throat> what I would question in view of some of the things we've heard is the statement that particle detectors are non-relativistic. 
because we had two talks, well, or you could say more than two in the meeting, where people are using light as detectors and these mm -hmm. analog systems, show Ono, uh, Bill Unruh. So those are not non-relativistic systems. How would you respond to that? Okay, I would say that in the end, uh, the, while light in itself, of course, this is kind of, we're using a field to detect a field, I agree. But in the end, you have to measure that light. So that laser will be hanging somewhere and you have a photo detector somewhere. That would be the non-relativistic bit. So sorry, it's putting the relativistic cut later on in the measurement theory. So sure, yeah, it's light that does it, but then that light has to be measured somehow, right? And that is where the- So, so you're gonna happens. say ultimately uh, it, there's gonna be a non-relativistic cut someplace. I would argue that, yes. I would argue okay. that. Okay. I see Chris has a hand up, looking forward to it. <laughs> Yes, okay. Am I invited? So, yeah, yes, of okay. course. <laughs> Sorry, I was Thanks. looking for the button. Thanks. So I'm going to pick up on this non-relativistic cut because I don't agree. Go ahead. Uh, you have a, a notepad, okay? And mm -hmm. you want to write down your result on that and you call this a non-relativistic pad of paper. But we know that if you raise that two centimeters in the air, there's a relativistic time dilation effect, which is measurable by experiment. Mm -hmm. So I really dispute the idea that there is such a thing as a non-relativistic cut. We live in a relativistic world. The laws of physics are relativistic uh, to, uh, you know, as far as we have yet uh, probed them. Uh, so I do not think this cut exists except as a convenient uh, means of description, where, of course, you know, if I want to throw a ball across the backyard, I use Newtonian mechanics. Uh, of course, but uh, I don't think that as a matter of principle, there is such a thing as a non-relativistic cut. All right, so Chris, uh, let me say first that I agree with what you said, and let me give you the, I don't want to convey the wrong idea. I'm not saying there's a fundamental relativistic cut. I'm saying that uh, there are two things in tension here. Well, I, let me first go on the argument you made. I agree. Uh, what I mean by a relativistic, a system that is what I have here, right? Uh, Right. Uh, I'm not saying the systems are fundamentally non-relativistic when we place the relativistic cut. I'm saying that I call a non-relativistic system, not one that doesn't have relativity in its guts. I mean it one that I don't need relativity to fully describe the physics that I'm seeing from it. For example, throwing a ball in a park is a problem that is fully solvable within Newtonian mechanics with non-relativistic considerations. Now, uh, the thing that I'm pointing out is that there are, there's a tension here. There's a tension between being able to have a measurement theory in fully relativistic descriptions of the world. And, uh, and the fact that we can actually carry measurements in a lab. And uh, one way of reconciling that is assuming that, well, my lab, at some point, there's some system in my lab that will eventually translate into a number, the measurement I'm doing, for which I don't really need relativistic theory to describe it. And therefore, because rel relativistic aspects can be neglected, all those problems that come from the fact that I cannot measure a relativistic system would not be relevant anymore. So the relativistic cut is what point in my chain of modeling my experiments, I ditch relativistic considerations and I use the usual quantum measurement theory to uh, measure those systems in my lab. So this is what I call placing the relativistic cut. At some point, we have a system for which we don't need relativity for the description. And luckily that means that we don't have the problem of uh, extracting classical values from it. I don't know if that will convince you. I'm not claiming it's fundamental. What I'm claiming is that there's no non-fundamental way of doing it. There's a tension there. And Dan has some comments, I think, on that, no? Uh, Chris, go ahead, please, sorry. Okay, so I, well, I saw there was something in the chat saying it's the same as a Heisenberg cut. I think I disagree with that because the Heisenberg cut is about uh, superpositions into, um, you know, into resolving uh, macroscopic superpositions. And that isn't the case with relativity. Relativity is much more about taking a limit, but then you have to be, in terms of the numbers, it's about taking a limit, right? But in terms of the conceptual interpretation, just because we throw a ball across a park and use Newtonian mechanics does not mean that we are allowed to talk about uh, absolute simultaneity. Right, absolute simultaneity we know does not exist because of relativity that has not gone away 
even though we can very happily use Newtonian mechanics to describe the ball in the park, yeah? So, so I think the one has to be, you, you can't really get rid of relativity, or at least you shouldn't get rid of the conceptual framework, even if your numbers are uh, to a good approximation described by uh, non-relativistic mecha okay. mechanics, for example. Let me then let me then formulate it different. If you can do, if you, if what is bothering you in this case is the fact that in my whole framework I have some things where relativity is not present and it should be by principle because everything is relativistic, then uh, what I would argue is okay, ditch the under the width detectors, but keep the POVMs that I do on the field. So imagine that. I only use the Android with detectors to define an operation on the field. And those POVMs that emerge out of doing the measurements with, uh, with the detector. So instead of postulating the existence of a non-relativistic cut there, I postulate, I give you a QFT, and then I give you a set of POVMs on the QFT that you can associate with those atomic physics experiments, and they are OK with the relativistic nature of the theory. And that would be the measurement theory in that case. See what I mean? Like, no. Forget about how I got those POVMs. Let me postulate them now. I know that I can relate it to real experiments through the Android with model, but if you don't want to include it, no need. Well, I think I would, well, I mean, you know where I'm coming from. Yeah, yeah of course, and I love <laughs> right? it. All right, because, <laughs> because I would want to say, where did you get your POVMs from? Uh, and uh, look for a microphysical description in terms of local physics, right? And say, well, you know, that's the, that's the explanation. And of course, uh, a, um, you know, a good approximation to an atom is something like a, an Unruh DeWitt detector. And so uh, it's an effective description of uh, a more fundamental description, which comes from the microphysics. So it's, uh, yeah, it's good that the Unruh DeWitt detector does that and, uh, and provides uh, usable numbers, but it's an approximation to something else, the, the quantum field theory description. So before opening the floor, but, for but, I, but I, I want to shut up now and let other people. No, I mean, I, I really appreciate, let me tell you, Chris, I really appreciate this discussion. This is the yeah. kind of discussion that I was hoping for. Sure. And, yeah. and uh, I, I have to tell you, I mostly agree with what you say. Um, the one point is, uh, in, a, in one way to say, look, a measurement theory in which we place a relativistic cut doesn't necessarily screw up the whole uh, QFT. That's one of the messages to take out. And uh, there's other things. I think Dan wants to say some things, and I'm going to let him. We are, in fact, we we're planning to send you a little manuscript to you and Max and, and other people. We're writing something related to this, and we will, before putting it out, we would love to discuss with you all these things. So, sure, sure. Really appreciate the discussion. So, I'm going to let Rick give the word to more people. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, let's just try to uh, go in order. So, please, Dan, you were the, the first one out of the multiple questions that, yep. Um, yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit in defense of the need for a relativistic cut in an explanation of the measurement problem in a relativistic context. Um, from one way of looking at things in general is that physical theories of all sorts don't fundamentally have a measurement theory associated with them. Like the world, it just exists as it is, and there may be things in it which organize into agents, but those are all uh, emergent sort of things. Right. And when we ask about a measurement theory, we're asking about, well, how does this formal description of the theory, how does it relate to the states of knowledge of agents, you know, who are evolved in a almost cl classical non-relativistic world, you know? And so it's that when we're trying to answer the measurement problem, we're not trying to just look at the physics exactly as it is and find out what it is. We, the process of understanding measurements is to understand the transition in an informational way from one theory into a more and more coarse grain theory in which we can, at the end of the day, see ourselves and come to see how we understand how we got that information out of there. So, so from my perspective, any successful answer to the question, how did you get your information from the quantum field? How did you get the 42? Like the you in that sentence is something which I don't think we can possibly describe uh, in a fully relativistic way and still have any sort of Personified, personified identification with, you know? I want to know how I got the number. Um, anyway, so at some point along that process, we have to, it's taking limits on our theories and the, the measurement values and the classical information that we're worried about only exists in those uh, simplified theories because that's where I exist. And that's where I hold the information, you know? Um, so that, that's why I think the relativistic cut is necessary just in terms of understanding how classical information comes out of quantum 
field theory. Okay, uh, I guess it was more of a comment, right? Uh, thanks for that, Then uh, I think it's very uh, enlightening to think in this way, at least uh, thinking of, uh, we are undergoing our time-like trajectories, right? And we see the wor world the way that we see it, or the way that a particle detector undergoing that would end up probing the field or seeing the field, if you will. So up to some extent, we have to be able to relate these things. And I agree that the UDW detector is a, a very nice way of doing it, for sure. Uh, Cisco, um, you're the next one in line, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I, I was just writing a quick comment in response to that. I, I think I, I would have to agree with Chris on this because the, for instance, that last uh, set of comments, the emergent structures that are these agents capable of measuring things, they're emerging from relativistic foundations. So in principle, there must therefore be a relativistic fundamental description of that entire, entire measurement process. So I, I, don't, I don't think uh, saying that the emergent structures have particular features and, you know, look you know non-relativistic in some sense is any reason for there not to be a fundamental relativistic description of that same process so, i think and, it's important for these things to to uh, uh, i don't want to be misunderstood here i also agree <laughs> with chris <laughs> see what i mean i'm not saying that uh, the android detector is the fundamental description for the measurement theory i'm certainly not what i'm saying is that you can build a measurement theory for qft effective if you want to all experiments that you can do with no problems with causality or locality or singularity out of coupling non-relativistic systems to the field and has advantages and disadvantages disadvantage is not fundamental as i agree i want to make it clear i agree <laughs> i'm not saying this is the fundamental way advantage it connects with experiments and extract numbers while keeping the relativistic features of the theory see what i mean this is this is more or less what i was going for in a way, the relativistic cut for me, uh, Dan, Dan also has more philosophical takes that are, are super nice, but I'm gonna be a bit more conservative here and say, uh, in reality, we have this tension. We cannot really, at least as of, as of today, we cannot really get a classical bit of information out of a QFT through a measurement probe, through a full relativistic description of the QFT. We can though with these particle detectors. And the question is legitimate to say, this is a question that Faye Dauker asked long ago, uh, oh, but the android width model is a non-relativistic system that may screw up with the, with the relativistic nature of the theory, right? QFT is all cool. Well, if you keep everything relativistic, you put something that measures that's not, are you introducing problems? So this is telling you, no, there are no big, or I would argue, there are no problems with it. So again, I agree with you, Cisco, and yeah. I agree with Chris. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, Albert? Yes. Yeah, so some remark to maybe try to help a little bit in this discussion. Actually, some of the points were tangentially mentioned already in some of the interventions, but uh, it seemed to me that uh, at least the more practical point of view uh, is just to say that, look, it's a matter of effective theories uh, that, that has been mentioned at some point um, in the sense that similarly to the fact that for many practical purposes, when we describe measurements, you know, with atomic systems or detection of photons and so on, I mean, in the end, we don't need to really understand all the details of, you know, quantum gravity or even, you know, uh, QCD and so on. I mean, as long as we are working, for example, at uh, very uh, much lower energies or longer distances, we can use an effective theory for that. So in this case, it's in addition to that, a non-relativistic effective description. So um, I think it's maybe better to, to just uh, understand it in that way. We are doing that all the time, uh, you know, when, 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 as I said, we're not considering all the microscopical uh, details of the theory in the UV, as long as we are interested in physics in the infrared regime. And similarly, as it was mentioned already tangentially, if you're interested in physics that involves, you know, uh, non-relativistic velocities, then you can also use an effective non-relativistic description. And so, you know, for practical purposes, you can even in a sense, uh, sort of quantitatively even describe the corrections in an expansion, for example, and just to say, look, I'm working uh, with this effective description in this regime, and I can even also quantify, you know, how my corrections are, uh, you know, based on the fact that, you know, that, that the fundamental theory 
is relativistic. And so, yeah, basically just, just, just this point that has already been mentioned in some of the interventions. The, the key thing I think is uh, uh, this effective description. And then it's more a practical matter. You are trying to, you, you have to be given an accurate enough description of your experiments and you know this kind of approach and even in principle uh, quantitatively allow you to determine how good you are doing in whatever regime you are given the parameters of, of the system that you're considering so let me add one more thing i fully subscribe what albert said adding more thing i would make a maybe daring claim less conservative claim i would say that the final step in all measurement processes that we know of or that i can think of in any lab in the experiment the final step involves some data processing of something that is a non-relativistic system. The final step would be, and by non-relativistic, again, I don't mean fundamentally non-relativistic. I mean, for which a non-relativistic approximation is good. So it's not unthinkable that having a detect, at some point placing a relativistic cut will not uh, have detrimental effects on the theory, I mean, the measurement theory. If you think of our eyes or photo diodes or, or computers processing the data, at the end of the day, I don't know of any experiment in which the, the last direct detection requires relativity. In the end, it's going to be a system for which you can place a relativistic cut. But then again, this is an, a non-conservative statement that's open for challenge. <laughs> and this, this really raises the question about what exactly we're comparing the accuracy of these effective measurement theories on. Yeah. Indeed. Ultimately, if we're, if we're comparing uh, a non-relativistic field theory and how well it approximates a relativistic one, we need to work out the relativistic one to be able to do that comparison to see how good of an approximation it is. Well, yeah, so that yeah. begs the question of developing the fully relativistic measurement theory in its own right, foundationally, and then using that to compare the accuracy of effective measurement approaches. That's right. And that's what the, the so bit that we're missing in the Fuster Verge uh, if you want uh, formalism, I think I would say. Yeah, but here perhaps I would add that although, I mean, in general, I kind of would agree, but the, the nice thing about effective uh, theories is that sometimes, even if you don't know the details of the fundamental theory, it's true that maybe you rely on some symmetries and so on, but you, you can try to work out, you know, what are the level of the expected corrections without really having the full underlying, without having had to deal with the full underlying fundamental theory. So you can even get some estimates of the corrections that you expect to uh, without really working out the full fundamental theory. So I think that you can even try to quantify up to a certain level that uh, without the need for fully solving the fundamental theory. So that's one of the emphasis of the effective theory approach. Fully agree. And that is, well, if you check the papers that I gave a reference, that's what we go to do in those papers, actually. That's the kind of thing we do. Perfect. Um, Max, Maximilian? Yes, thank you. Hi. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, I, um, I would like to uh, probably reiterate something that, that has already been said or that we have already agreed on. Uh, um, I, uh, I also agree that um, on, on a more fundamental level, probably um, just as this Uno de Witt detector model emerges, um, you should maybe look at something like this, this uh, kind of uh, light matter interaction or so, and then you make some approximations, you end up at the Uno de Witt uh, interaction, basically you um, go to the, I don't know, monopole um, limit, and then you end up with effectively this, uh, this interaction. And this, this gives you a, a good model in a good regime. And um, basically all, all results that, uh, that we've heard, and um, also many, many nice talks uh, during this conference basically establish that um, in those regimes in which um, the approximations are valid, um, we do not run into any major problems. And um, I think this is this is the important bit. Whereas on the other hand, of course, um, we all agree that it is not and it cannot be a, a fundamental description. But it's also not in some it's also not designed to be a fundamental description, and it's uh, it, it's honest about that. So um, um, yes, uh, so I, I think we all agree on on that, and uh, I, I also agree on that. Um, coming back maybe to uh, to maybe what is a fundamental description or what is not um, what uh, what has been said before this um, forgetting the uh, non-relativistic structure and, and focusing on the POVMs mm -hmm. um, just before um, I, um, I I was uh, well I was um, euphoric and uh, I think I wrote it in the chat um, 
isn't there uh, exactly the point that if you look at um, at the non-relativistic detector and you trace that the detector, the P of M that you get um, is um, again, it's uh, it, it's a P of M stemming from a non-relativistic detector. You should see from the P of M, you should see from the update that uh, it, it, it is coming from a non-relativistic detector. That is, you, you should still run into Sorkin type signaling probably not in the, well, again, not in the regime in which uh, the non-relativistic approximation is applicable, but still in a, from a fundamental point of view, you, you should not talk about this, this POVMs. Okay, so, so that's a really good question. So if you consider that among all the POVMs you can do in the field, now I'm gonna consider a subset. That's the one that emerges out of Andrew DeWitt kind couplings. Um, some of them are free from the Sorkin problem. Those are the ones associated with point-like measurements. Of course, those POVMs uh, have to be understood as non-selective POVMs. The non-selective, yeah, yeah. So the non-selective POVMs have no sorting problem if we're talking about point light detectors. I mean, the details of that are a bit more, it will appear soon on archive. So the, if you have smearing, you have the same kind of sorting kind of problem as uh, with Jose de Ramon talking his talk about. It's the same kind of thing, under control kind of problem. So yes, for sure, for smear, smear, spatially smear in a particular foliation, under with detectors, you would have this, uh, if you want, controlled sorting problem that you can totally know exactly what to neglect and know exactly what to look at. Point light detectors, though, completely uh, completely OK. The POVMs that you get out of that uh, don't have the sorting kind of problem. In that sense, um, if, I, if, if I may, or uh, give a follow-up comment. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the same sense, you could look at uh, you could look at the FME framework, and if you um, if if you if you might criticize, well, um, you you have to invoke this this someone somewhere knows how to measure something, and you're basically just um, going down the measurement chain. And um, if if this is unsatisfactory for you, you could in, in principle do the of course the the, the same thing in, in the FV framework. You could um, you could see well you you trace out the probe and you just look at the. POVMs or the, the quantum channels that you get from that. And you will see that they are perfectly fine. I fully they agree. Are... So the, the missing bit there would not be the fact that we have POVMs now is how those POVMs connect with what somebody in a lab is doing. That is the missing step. Uh, as in like those POVMs, when somebody measures in a lab with say an atomic, atomic sensor, it's certainly not measuring a well localized element of the algebra of the field that is interacting with uh, with uh, with the atom. There's it's non-trivial. The the interaction makes it non-trivial. What are the induced observables in the system that you're measuring for the things that you want to know from the field? It's because of the interaction theory. If it's a free theory, everything is fine. But the interaction mixes up some things. I would say that what is missing is saying, look, experimentally, is that thing that you do corresponds to this POVM that in the FV framework. Uh, corresponds to this. Again, please don't understand it as a security system. I think the FV framework is the right way to go about this from the foundational point of view. I'm pointing out uh, uh, how doing it in a different way, introducing some relativistic cut, does not necessarily screw up everything in the relativistic theory and connects with experiments. Again, this is the pro and con, if you want. Con, not fundamental. Pro, connects directly with what experimentalists do. Uh, it can be turned, right? Pro, connect early with what experimentalists do. Uh, 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 con, it's not fundamental, right? So this is the this is where we stand, <laughs> all of us. So in the end, I do agree with that discussion. And I think the discussion is actually we're in the right terms. I, I don't think that I disagree with anything I've heard. Uh, then, I mean, yeah. Yeah, so I just had a, just a quick comment on this. Yeah, it, what Eduardo just said was basically what I was uh, trying to say earlier. That, that I think the, the story of how we get measurements out of quantum field theory is not complete. You have not answered the question unless you connect with experiments and, um, and connect with the basically classical, basically just the, the classical perspective, not existence, but the perspective of the people doing the experiments. So, uh, and that has, so this is why I think you have to take a, a, the cut at some point, just in that story, just if I'm going to accept that as a story of how I came to know something, I would need that to, there would be some transition somewhere there. Right. It's not a fundamental thing that I'm thinking of this cut as. Before moving, before moving to the next, so, so that is clear and understood. Um, so the same way that you could say the FV formalism is not complete without that, I would say the unruly model is certainly not complete by construction because it's not fundamental. You need to be both fundamental and connect to experiment to have a foundational measurement theory, right? Um, that's all, yeah.
There are many hands, tell us, yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, I guess we're all on the same page, like, of the <laughs> what's fundamental, what's not, where are the pros and cons. Uh, yeah, has follow, please. Hi. Uh, well, at this point, after all those interventions, probably what I want to say is um, partly partially redundant, but uh, yes, uh, uh, yeah, I wanted to insist on the, uh, insist on the, on the thing uh, that we are saying that, of course, the proposal is not saying everything is fundamental as that. And that's why I, I see as did the comparison between the relativistic car and the Heisenberg car, because we are talking in the measurement theories are, are about how we extract information from the physical systems. Uh, and uh, in, in, in those cases, in, uh, what we are dealing is with uh, theories that we may understand as fundamental, but for some reason we don't know how to. Do. Uh, it's, it's what Cisco was saying. In the, the ideal thing would be to have the fundamental thing and get the approximation from it. In the case of quantum field theory, we would make the non relativistic approximation. And in the case of non relativistic quantum mechanics, we would like to be able to extract how we measure from, from the fundamental quantum mechanics. But the thing is that we, as we don't know how to do that, at least not now, um, the, the, the cuts. What, uh, what the cats give us uh, are the, the points at which we can make the approximations and get the way in which we can extract the information from the physical system. So the relativistic cut for me is the cut at which we can say where we can extract the information from the quantum field theory to quantum mechanics. And the Heisenberg cut is where we can extract the, quantum, the information from the quantum system to the classical system. For that, in, in that sense, is why I see that they are conceptually, no, of course they are not the same cut. But they, they are in some way conceptually the same as um, as, as ways of um, yeah, bypassing the difficulties of not have of, of not knowing how to fundamentally describe uh, the thing. And yeah, about, and about the well, I, I was also going although it's um, it's already answered. To answer about uh, yeah, to answer to Max comments on POVMs, I would argue that yeah, the POV the, the PVM on the detector itself uh, because it it, it works uh, it, it can be shown to be Mm, to respect causality for a point like detector, I would argue that, that the POVN, the added group itself, it doesn't introduce any causality uh, violations and, and there's no sort of inside signaling. It's the, the smearing, the same smearing that, that can induce yeah. causality by faster than light signaling in the case of the, the interaction without making a PVN on the detector at all. It's the same that if you do a PVN, well, it also allows you to do faster than light signaling. That, that interaction already allows you to do that. So that the PVN itself doesn't introduce any, any additional difficulty. Rick, you're muted. Thanks, so, Sid. Uh, do you have any comments, Sid? No, no, there, let's, let, there right. are more, <laughs> two more people. That went. Chris again and Rob again. I don't know who was first. All right, so Chris, please. Uh, you're the next one in line. Chris, Thanks, uh, you I, I, though I think Rob might have been ahead of me, in, in fact. Um, but well, three things strike me. Um, one is actually I wanted to say thank you because this discussion is is very good, and I think it's it's a measure of the success of this conference that we've had such a good discussion, the sort you would have in a bar or a restaurant or something after a proper conference. So I, so thank you very much for that. The second thing is I clearly need to update my photograph and tidy my <laughs> office. Uh, and, but the third thing is, that, um, it strikes uh, right. it strikes me that there are there are several gaps. Okay, we've talked about things that are missing in, in formalisms. So one is uh, there's the big gap, the quantum gap. Someone somewhere knows how to measure something. That applies to the uh, to any form of quantum uh, measurement, right? Um, there is a measurement chain that you could associate with the uh, with the atom. Right, you've got one photo detector, but well, that probably gets multiplied by more atoms, and so you have the the same measurement chain problem there, but just in quantum mechanics. So then the other gap, so that's one gap that's at the end of, of all of this. Um, so at the microphysics level, there is a sort of descri description in terms of quantum field theory, and I agree that as yet there's a, a gap in uh, explaining or giving a, a model there that. Uh, models what would happen with an atom, for example, okay? But that you could say that's actually a technical problem, right? Uh, in principle, in principle, we would know how to begin. Uh, the trouble is we strongly suspect that we'd get stuck, okay? Um, but on the other hand, uh, you, you could say that there's also, that that gap is the gap before the Unruh-DeWitt 
type detector picks up because you could say that that description is incomplete because there's no understanding of where that comes from um, from fundamental physics. So, so essentially, uh, what we have is the, the fundamental description, the microphysical description, and we have the effective description, and we have no current means of getting between them for the, for the technical reasons mentioned, and we have no way of getting out of it at the other end because no one has yet solved the measurement problem in uh, quantum uh, mechanics or quantum theory more generally. So, so that's a sort of panorama of, uh, of where all the holes are, uh, as I see it. Yeah, uh, if I may say, yes, I agree with you again, Chris. There may be two comments only. One of them is about while it is true that uh, how somebody measuring, what is the process of measuring and how it emerges something classical is still an open thing. It's also true that in uh, laboratories, they have enough, if, enough ability to write a number out of that that has predictive power in the sense that they do update with something faulty, which is... Uh, yeah, we measure this atom and there's effectively a projective measurement on the atom, et cetera, et cetera. But it is enough for them to be able to predict what's gonna happen in that sense. So they, while it is true that there's no funda the foundation is not solved at all, there is some effective window to that problem. The second one is about uh, the emergence of an atom within quantum field theory. What is the foundation and origin of a bound system in QFT? Now, I would argue that that makes things Quite tricky. Uh, you said it's just a technical problem. Well, I agree in principle. It could be quite tricky because a bound state, do we know anything about the localization properties of a bound state? Do we know anything about entanglement in a bound state? What's the entanglement structure? It is non-trivial to predict without knowing uh, what a bound state of an interacting QFT is. It's very difficult to talk about locality and localization and localizability in those cases. While we know that effective atomic models can be localized in the sense that I discovered in my lab with this description and it's local enough to have predictive power. Uh, what the fundamental result would be, well, again, a technical problem, it may raise some foundational or fundamental aspects too. What if there's no way to get localization in those cases? What does that mean? What would the non-locality mean for those states? What if bound states are intrinsically non-local? This kind of things. Um, and by non-local, I mean that they cannot have a compact support. They cannot exist in a closed lab. Uh, there are non-trivialities with that that I think are not just within, while technical, they would be under the, under the magnifying glass of foundational considerations too. But then again, that's a different story. I do agree with what you said, Chris, so just a couple of comments. All right, uh, so Rob, Rob Mann, you have the last uh, raised hand. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, sorry. I guess I'm, I'm a bit, uh, I'm gonna argue somewhat Chris's viewpoint. Uh, mm -hmm. I certainly agree that you have to connect uh, to experiment as Dan has said, and I guess Eduardo, but I, I, if I, I mean, it's been a while, by which I mean five or 10 minutes ago <laughs> where I heard it. So I, I don't wanna misquote Eduardo, but I thought the statement was there aren't any relativistic measurements, but I would say there are, for example, the vessel Levine experiment comparing a clock on the ground to a clock moving in a rocket ship. That clock is moving at relativistic speed. Why isn't that a relativistic measurement? And more generally, the whole global positioning system yes. as examples. So most of the time it's non-relativistic, but I if that's not a relativistic measurement, what no. is it? So, so Rob, this is not what I, so yeah, I mean, maybe I, I, I misrepresented. What I mean is that, yes, there are relativistic measurements and those are the ones, for example, a field coupled into a field, light measuring something is a relativistic measurement. However, in the chain of measurement, all the way from me knowing where I am, this is kind of what Dan was making the point. To me, the GPS system, very relativistic indeed, but there's a point in between the, the behavior of the atomic clocks in the satellites in orbit, to me, knowing where I am, in which what I write is some coordinates in a piece of paper that's a non-relativistic system. At some point, there's a point in which in the process of extracting the classical information, I'm working with a non-relativistic system. That's what I meant with no fully relativistic measurements fully that I know of, the whole chain being relativistic. And again, don't confuse what I say or don't, don't interpret what I say as it's not relativistic. No, I mean it's effectively non-relativistic, where relativity doesn't matter anymore. That's what I mean. 
That's what I wanted to say. In the chain well, I, I think that statement needs a bit of thought. I mean, I guess mm -hmm. I would infer from that that you're invoking the consciousness of the observer relative to the apparatus and saying that relationship is intrinsically non-relativistic. Not even getting there. Is, maybe it isn't, but it's, I mean, is that the statement you're making? Maybe not even there. Imagine that that's an intermediate step, and then I write it down in some notepad and show somebody else. <laughs> At least the notepad, <laughs> I think, is describable without relativity. I don't want to get into the muddy waters of consciousness, though. <laughs> but but I, I think you have to. I mean, if I, I mean, nobody was on the rocket that was launched with Vesso and Levine, but they could have been. And, and so they could have written down what that clock said. So doesn't that make them relativistic observers? Well, well not in their own the reference clock. frame, right? In their own reference right. frame, they're well, just well, there. Yeah. That's, the, that's the thing. Well, right? but Earth people are relativistic compared to them. So again, I think you need to clarify what it means. We're Rob. Uh -oh. Vistic, I, I mean, this is going back to what you do in uh, you know, uh, 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 kindergarten relativity. Well, that's sort of an oxymoron. But um, oh. but uh, uh, one observer's on a rocket, the other isn't, and they make measurements. Uh, I would say the one on the rocket is relativistic compared to the one on the Earth, or vice versa. But they both are not non-relativistic. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm talking about the, how to describe the internal degrees of freedom of the thing doing the measurement or the thing processing the data. That is what I was talking about. Sure, you can get a non-relativistic system internally. When you say a particle, that particle has internal degrees of freedom. You see, the under the weight model in that sense is relativistic because I can get it and put it in a rocket and it moves and indeed moves in non-inertial trajectories and very relativistic trajectories. But I'm talking about the information that it gathers and how it's extracted and processed, right? Again. The well, that but that need, but Eduardo, that needs clarity. What about the Large Hadron Collider? They're smashing things together at 99.99999, the speed of light. Uh, what so you're saying, so let me hear me out. Okay. It sounds like you're saying when the particles collide, that doesn't count as a measurement. It's not until the Atlas detector does something that it counts as a measurement, and that's non-relativistic. And isn't that right, Rob? I like science. Well, <laughs> but I, I'm just saying maybe it's right, but then you've got to decide. Uh, but but then would you say, okay, suppose somebody came in and, and said, okay, Large Hadron Collider, your electric bill's too high, you're only allowed to collide things at 10 kilometers an hour, would then the, the collision count as being a measurement? Or not? No, no, no. I'm not saying yeah. you're going. You're doing the logic the other way. No, no. I'm going one way, not both. I'm not saying that being non-relativistic makes you a measurement or a detector. I'm saying that in the chain of detection, at some point, there's some system that can be approximated as non-relativistic internally. That's that's the whole thing. But, but, but perhaps what Rob is saying. I mean, what could the, you have these two? Saying it rather in terms of cuts, as you these two cuts, the Heisenberg cut and this relativistic cut, and but it could be that. Uh, you know, that maybe you, uh, there are some kind of measurements where both of them overlap, namely that the sort of first measurement process where you go from a quantum mechanical system to something that can be, you know, uh, effectively or for all practical purposes described in terms, in, in classical terms, because there was, you know, enough decoherence and then you can describe in terms of quasi-classical correlations and so on. Maybe that was happening in the relativistic regime. And you know, from that point on, yes, you have a chain of additional steps. Maybe at the end of that, you have what you were saying, but in the sense that they are, you know, effectively classical. So it's true that you would still have a chain there, and maybe at the very end you would have something that would be non-relativistic. But it, it would still raise the question then of, uh, you know, the moment this thing can be effectively described as classical, and then it brings up, of course, the other question. Uh, can I have maybe some situations where that process is still happening, where the physics is, you know, the relativistic effects are important. Maybe in some experiments, it could be like that. And then you see, you still have a chain. It's true after that, that brings you maybe to some, at the end uh, for practical purposes that you record that result <clears throat> in a non-relativistic well, well, setting. I, but then what you really mean by measurement or this chain of measurements 
you know, it brings also that question then of quantum mechanics, you know, at what step you start describing what was a, what needed really a full quantum mechanical description in terms of something that can be well approximated by, you know, some classical correlations, maybe stochastic and so on, but, and then, you know, the two questions actually become even more related than one wanted to. Well, maybe. I guess I would say, uh, what I'm trying to say is I think this notion of a relativistic cut needs better clarity because I think, uh, I, well, I mean, to go back to the rocket experiment, the person on the rocket never actually needs to be in the same rest frame as the guy on the planet to compare results. They could send radio signals. And in fact, I think that's actually what was done in the experiment to compare the clocks. So, uh, you know, maybe this concept can be clarified in a way that would make us all happy. I'm just trying to say I don't think Chris is happy yet, and I'm not sure I am either entirely. So <laughs> point, I sympathize point with the notion. Point taken. I don't know, maybe Chris, are you happy, Chris? I, I agree with you, Rob. I think I'd need a lot more clarity on, on this. I'm, not to, I'm, I'm really not sure that there is a fundamental non-relativistic cut. I mean, I'm thinking about muon, cosmic muons colliding with the with the particle detector. That's a very high velocity collision and it results in a in some click. Okay. Uh, and of course in the uh, well the muon thinks that the detector is coming towards it very fast too. Uh, but I, I'm really not sure. I, I mean this really seems to me to be a relativistic measurement. Right. So in the case of the muon, that one is easier because in the end, what happens is that you have an excitation of an atom and uh, you're capturing the, the products of the disintegration. And in the end, that atom is processed through a measurement and the atom, the relativistic cut in this case comes into the internal dynamics of the atom. So in, in that process, in the end, when you capture the signal in a CCD, it's about atomic, atomic physics. And in the atomic physics regime, we can neglect relativistic effects. And that's where I would place a relativistic cut there. Or I could place if I want. So this is the, another, another comment, right? Mm. If, I, if we decide so, if we decide so. It's not that you need it, it's not fundamental. Yeah, but I, mean, this I, is a different I agree. I, I certainly agree you can use atomic physics to, to describe it. Um, I, I'm All right, so I think that the, the question, and this would be in, in Rob's direction is, in clarifying what's going on is the status of this cut, all right? Because it's one thing to have a convenience of calculation. And then it's another to say that um, the interpretational framework of relativity can be put to the side at the same moment that you, you make this cut, right? Uh -huh. you, you're, you're doing atomic physics, but you must remember in the background, there's no, that there is relativity of simultaneity. Um, you, you also know that if your atom were a little bit higher, uh, then the, there would be a time dilation effect. And, and these days, this is measurable over centimeters and, and the velocity uh, dilation um, and, um, yeah, the, the um, dilation effect for velocity is uh, measurable at a few meters per second. So uh, this brings it very much into the scales where we feel we are at home, right? So if you see somebody going by on a bicycle, well, this is something now where if we are doing the right sort of measurements, we can measure the time dilation effect. Mm -hmm. And this has been done. And yeah. likewise, if you raise something just a few centimeters, one can measure the, the gravitational time uh, dilation effect. Yeah. So it depends what you're doing. Um, and I, I think that the relativistic regime is not as far away as you're sort of implying. But, but, but I, I, let's go uh, with Rob's line that um, with a bit of clarification, it will be interesting to see see how this looks. So I would just one quick comment on that. In that those experiments of low velocity relativistic effects, if, if, if I may call them so, I would say that in those experiments, the relativistic cut is not there. It's higher up in the scale later on in the measurements that are done. Uh, but then again, yeah, uh, the point is well taken. Um, this is something that is, uh, you know, still being worked out in a, in a conceptual framework. And uh, I will certainly share uh, when we got this finished and, and ready to be read and clarified uh, with you. And I think the point is well taken on 
the not obvious notion of what I mean by the relativistic cut here. Yeah. All right, uh, Ben. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to respond uh, to a little bit of that because we are we are introducing this relativistic cut concept in this manuscript we're writing, and we'd love to get your feedback on it. Yeah, um, there, I think it's important to distinguish that there's there's two aspects to relativity. Uh, you can have relativity without quantum, in which case you have say relativistic trajectories on possibly curved space times and things, and I, and that, that's one type of relativity, but then when relativity mixes with quantum, then you get these, uh, you know, um, algebra of observables and QFTs, and that's a very different scenario. So I think what we're thinking about as the relativistic cut is just that second one. Not saying that this, that we're basically in Galilean physics or Newtonian physics, you know, but that we uh, that we don't need quantum field theory as a descriptor anymore. So. Uh, so all, all these ones about uh, time dilation and classical trajectories and things, I, I don't think that's exactly what we have in mind. But yeah, we didn't spell that out, and we will be clear mm -hmm. to, sure to in the paper. Good but point. Yeah. One, one last comment, though. Uh, your point about how where the cut is depends on what we're going to do and the sensitivity of our measurements. That's absolutely right. And it also depends on what we do with the systems afterwards and what, what systems we don't know about that we'll come into contact with later. I mean, even in the Heisenberg cut, you have some system and it has some level of decoherence. If you measure that carefully enough, you can detect any small amount of coherence that remains, you know? Or it's always possible to recohere things. If you somehow manage the whole system and it's all in a big quantum computer and you recohere it, then you can make those manifest again, even if you don't have great measurement devices. So, so yeah, it, it depends. This, this idea of when you can take the cut is thoroughly like contingent on the types of measurement apparatuses that you have available, what their accuracy are, and how you can manipulate the system in the future. So, yeah, absolutely. Thing I note to make is that there's two discussions here, right? There's about if the algorithm with the model is okay for a measurement theory in QFT, in what sense it is okay, and in what sense it introduces problems or not. And the other one is a different discussion whether we can have a notion of relativistic cut in our experiments and if it's present always, and if it has to be there or not, and how fundamental that is. Those are two different discussions. I think it's important to clarify that there are different aspects <laughs> because we're delving into the second one quite a lot. True. <laughs> uh, Polo, yeah, please. Go, oh, go, oh, okay. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, well, uh, um, well, basically, uh, I was going to address the same thing uh, Dan said. Uh, I think that maybe the name relativistic, uh, the, the part of relativistic is, is maybe misleading us from the point because uh, I don't think um, it kind of depends on whether the system we are dealing with it, it takes uh, relativistic velocities or not. In, in Robert Mann's uh, example, for example, yeah, sure, the rocket is, um, is, uh, can, can get uh, to relativistic velocities, but the person that is in the rocket and, and is measuring, um, the measurement is, is done dealing with non-relativistic quantum mechanics. I mean, I think the cut, what tells us is whether the relativistic cut means sets, sets the limit in which we can describe the measurement using non-relativistic non -relativistic quantum mechanics. And in that sense, it's non-relativistic. We, we, we are using uh, regular quantum mechanics. And we don't, we don't, we don't need um, quantum theory that, that is what, what Dan said. The fact that the rocket is relativistic doesn't mean that we cannot make the measurement using non-relativistic quantum mechanics. That is kind of the point, even though the rocket is maybe moving at relativistic velocities. Which is similar to what you can export to the unruly width in that sense. The unruly width is internally a non-relativistic system, but can move in relativistic trajectories, no problem. I mean, relativistic to whom, right? That, that is the question at the end. I mean, for the system, it's always stopped and the quantum field is in the back interacting with it. And although the quantum field is relativistic, uh, in the frame of the, the, the detector, it's an atom, right? Or what I mean is two level system. We incur space times and be in areas of high curvature and things like that. Yeah, yeah but it's also localized, right? So, so in the same, at the same time, it's it's hard to talk about these these things Agreed. because of the fact that the yeah. system is localized. Sure, but but precisely that's that's why it's uh, free independent. In the case of the rocket, it's uh, the, the detector uh, gets relativistic and uh, it starts uh, messing with localization and so on from the from the Earth from the, the Earth's perspective. But for the person who is measuring, it's still localized and we can use uh, uh, regular quantum mechanics. That, that's kind of the point. Perfect. Yep. Uh, Stefan? 
Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I may have a, a, what seems to be a naive question, but uh, uh, in, in this problem, if, if I think about the, the example that was given by uh, Rob on the LHC, and uh, so there's a measurement, there's an interaction that takes place and it's clearly in a relativistic setting. But then the question is, how does it propagate through the chain and how does it get non-relativistic in the end? But my understanding of measurements in, in a quantum setting is that uh, they propagate through entanglement. You start by entangling two things by interaction. And then uh, every time you go through that chain, you, you have an additional level of entanglement to more and more complicated systems. And what makes things uh, appear to be classical or decohered uh, is something like losing, losing trace of some, uh, uh, losing track of some degrees of freedom, taking a trace somewhere and, and, and uh, um, but all, all these things seem to, 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 to point to something that's completely relativistic from beginning to end because there's full entanglement. And then when you lose some degrees of freedom, maybe it's because the speed of light is, is finite or something like that. Uh, is it not true that if you take it in, in into account all this, uh, then everything is completely relativistic. You have to, to keep that, that, that relativistic um, point of view. So the, for example, let, let, me, let me talk about things. So two, two things, to the point, to the pro whether considering entanglement, the coherence solves the, forget relativity, the quantum measurement problem. I would argue it doesn't. It definitely allows you to go from a quantum probability distribution to a classical probability distribution that the coherence destroys the coherences in a particular basis in which you're measuring. And that's through entanglement with environment for sure. But you still have a probability distribution. It does not tell you what is the result of a single shot experiment. The whole point is how to translate the probability distributions to a number that you get in a single shot experiment. That's the key point of the, of the openness of the problem of the measurement problem. Now, the issue, the issue with this is like, yes. So here's the whole point. The measurement, so with the moment that you do, it might not want to not fix experiment. So somebody has a quantum field and we want to measure it by, you know, there's some atom that couples to the field in some space during some time. And then later on, you want to, um, you want to uh, uh, get conclusions about, you know, learn something about the field through the fact that the atom is now entangled with the field and got some correlation with the field and also with the initial state of the field. It can tell you things about the field before. So what you do now is, measuring the atom. What I would say is that, yeah, the description of the interaction of the atom with the field is fully relativistic from the beginning to the end. What you do to the atom, while of course fundamentally relativistic, does not need relativity. You just need atomic physics to get a really accurate description to whatever precision of measurement you want that you have in your lab for the atomic physics experiment in particular that you're doing. Uh, so in that case, in that case in which I'm not concerned about the atom being at a higher distance from the ground and so on, I'm concerned about the measurement after interacting with the field, a relativistic cut could be placed at the atom. That is- In that the, example, uh, yes, of course. But and, I think of course, Rob was example, giving examples like the one that I'm, I was talking about in my talk uh, of interaction of light. You say you have to go through the chain, yes. but the chain is a chain of entanglement, so- Still, at some point you will have a detector that is gonna give you a 27 on the screen. And that detector will be eventually, I'm going to the extreme just to make sure I don't have any, any. and that detector will be described by electronics and those electronics usually fundamentally non-relativistic in that sense. So then the cut maybe have to be raised as is being said, depending on the context of the experiment. Uh, but you could, I would argue you could still place a relativistic cut if you want at some point in the chain. So there is actually another question from Dennis. Dennis had some comments, so let me. Sorry, I'm sorry, am I next? Or? Yeah, please, Dennis, yeah. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, so first of all, I'm, I'm sort of a newcomer to this uh, conference. I've been attending the Brisbane uh, branch of the RQI, and this is the first time attending the Canadian one. So I am an experimentalist from Polytechnic Montreal, and Stefan was presenting some of our work. And kind of, you know, the, the stuff that Sho Ono presented earlier in this conference and also Bill Unruh in general and you, the work from University of Constance is really kind of pushing 
um, I think a different type of detector um, in, in maybe a complementary one to the Unruh de Witt model that, that is talked about here. So I appreciated the comments that some of you made about the need to connect to the experimentalists and, and um, to kind of to, to normalize the language and the point of view. So some of the feedback from my perspective would be that I think the treatment of scalar fields is a bit naive and uh, there are some kind of general comments thrown around that yeah we can certainly go victorially and and um, you know but but that remains to be seen a more serious comment from my perspective is uh, the kind of the the full quantum mechanical treatment of the interaction of the atom in a sense that there must be a selection rule right so there is a dipole allowed transition in that atom that you're using to uh, to interact with. So having a resonance, having a dissipation in the system, it also must imply by Kramer's chronic, by causality, that there is a, a dispersive response of the detector. So there is a there is a dispersion in its off resonant excitation. Now, in addition to, in a real atom, in addition to having a um, dipole allowed transition, there could be possibility of quadrupole allowed transitions. That's, you might say that goes beyond the dipole approximation. That's only partly true because in principle, you can access quadrupole allowed transitions with two photon processes. So two photon processes is already we're entering in the regime of nonlinear optics. So here it's still the treatment in the, in the formalism is still in the chi one so-called you know, linear, linear coupling between the dipole and the field. If we go beyond the linear coupling, which is the point actually of the work that Stefan presented and 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 Show is analyzing and the work from Constance is by going to the nonlinear coupling between the field and the detector. In this case, a, a very short pulse. We can actually get much more information out of this. So the number twenty-seven uh, or forty-two is, is to be interpreted as a measure of something relativistic. In fact, because we have a really short pulse that's propagating a quasi localized pulse that's propagating at near the speed of light and the and the quantum signals that is detecting will be different if we actually made this co propagating um, co propagating condition if we can change that co propagating condition. Um, and uh, finally, maybe uh, to kind of to, to say that this number 27 is of course kind of going back to what Stefan was mentioning. So at the moment, our experiments are only doing a single pulse experiment that's only projecting the vacuum fluctuations in the localized reference frame that's moving at the near the speed of light. But we have, we are cooking up and there are already experiments also I should mention in, in ETH Zurich that are looking at multi-pulse effects. So by probing these localized space-time volumes, not by one, but by two pulses, the number 27 is already telling you something about the correlation structure between those two events and time. So the, so the experiments are getting really sophisticated and I would love to see kind of that sophistication or, or that kind of... Uh, you muted yourself, Dennis. Yeah, so sorry, I, I'm finishing up, so I apologize. So anyway, so I'm just saying on the experimental side, we have this really interesting stuff going on. And at the moment, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't see that in the theory side and I would love to see it. And also just wanted to bring up again that point of the 27 and 42 and, and the relativistic aspect of the measurement. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Very good. I have several answers to that. Uh, so things that I... I'm not saying, I want to clarify. I'm not saying that the, the measurement is not a measurement of a relativistic thing. Having a relativistic cut could still be measuring something very relativistic. The relativistic cut is not saying what you're measuring is a non-relativistic thing. The relativistic the notion of a relativistic cut is within the chain of your measurement and processing, there will be some point that the electronics of your computer would not require relativity to be described. Even if you are measuring something relativistic, now about the scalar versus more uh, more formal. So I'm pointing at this paper because in that paper, for example, we do a full electromagnetic coupling, atomic coupling to the to the field, all vector, and actually talk about the regimes in which the under the width can approximate and in what in which ones it can't. Also considering the internal degrees of freedom of the atom as well, uh, it being quantum, not classical, as in like yeah, you have an electron and a proton, and the electron there's a center of mass and relative motion degree of freedom that are also quantum. 
Uh, also, nonlinear processes we've looked at as well in some papers. I don't cite it here, but maybe I should have. Um, there's a recent thing on archive, uh, um, Erickson Choa, Alison Sachs, uh, Irene Lopez, and myself on looking at nonlinear optics processes within the context of particle detectors. So certainly, um, I think those are good points. And, and I agree. So it's, it's things in theory are usually more complicated if you want to do it from foundations. But it, it's not true that we only look at scalar cases. <laughs> there, there's research. I'm pointing at that one. That one, I think, is you may, may be interested in reading that one, perhaps. OK, cool. Thank you. No problem. Wow, still, I mean, we're running a bit. I don't know. Yeah, yeah it's been a very long time. But I mean, the, the discussion yeah, is make, very make cool, it, right? So. <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to say one thing connecting with what Eduardo just said about the about the multi-pulse thing, uh, measuring correlations between different places in space-time. There's quite a lot of literature on entanglement harvesting, where you take two of these under DeWitt detectors and couple them to two separate places and then do a joint measurement on the probe states after that. And so you characterize through these sorts of measurements the entanglement structure and correlation structure of the vacuum as well. So we, we do have theoretical treatments of that as well. So, so people have to leave. Maybe we should stop and, and, and because I really want to thank this audience. Rob probably already left. But there's like one thing I wanted to say before. And I have to go through all the slides again because I went back. Sorry about that. I think Rob already left. A non-relativistic but high speeds, as he said. Let's see. Oh my. Get in there. Yeah. So, okay. So First of all, I just a couple of words from the point of view of the organizers. Thank you so much to all of you for having come. This has been an amazing conference in the sense of um, the participation. There's something that I was really sad about. Um, that is, uh, most of the work that one does in a conference is not giving a talk. It's talking about it later with some coffee or beer or whatever, and, and actually discussing these things. Uh, we tried in this conference to give infinite question time uh, so people can discuss anything they need. And it seemed to work well. It's funny, we didn't enforce hard cutoffs for the conference time, for the talk time, and also gave opportunities to talk to everybody. And look at that, people can self-regulate. It's amazing, it worked really well. So I really want to thank the, the audience without being, no, you are run out of time or whatever. Everybody, everybody worked really well. Discussions were amazing. And I really enjoyed what this conference became. So uh, thank you very much, audience. That was, that was truly amazing. Uh, all the participants, thank you for that. There is the, there is something interesting. When I was looking for the uh, pictures of the conference, and I want to thank the rest of the people in the background that work on this conference. Uh, when I look for RQA Australia, I got this on Google Images, and it's like, what? <laughs> How is that related to RQA? And it's Gold Coast. That's the right place. That's Queensland. That's where Tim Ralph is. But apparently, this is the thing that you get. Apparently, there is a company <laughs> in Queensland called Resuscitation Quality Improvement. I thought I would warn you, don't confuse that with uh, our RQI. It's a different thing. Now, I want to, this is a real picture of, this is one for the Vienna 2018 conference. This is a thing that we miss. We miss being able to be in person. This is no substitute to that, but I think we made the most out of it, which is great. I want to thank the co-chairs of the ISRQI, the chair Silke Byfurner and the co-chair uh, Jorma Loco. Uh, Jorma Silke, thank you very much for all the support as well. And uh, I want also uh, everybody, thanks uh, Nick uh, and Tim Ralph, the organizers of the Australian session. And finally, probably the biggest applause has to go to the superhero of the conference, which is uh, Thales, <laughs> Rick. Thales, thank you very much. <laughs> Without you, this would not have been possible and all the logistics that you took care of. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Edo. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's it pretty much. That's the end of the conference. Thank you, everybody, for participating. I loved the interactions. They were great for an online conference. And yeah, it was great. For We had, how, how long? It's been four months almost, right? Uh, three months. 15 sessions, right? So that's uh, three months and three weeks. <laughs> there you go. So uh, thank you for your patience, for still coming here every, every time. This was long because everybody got a chance to talk and to discuss, which was great. And I think maybe we can learn a couple of things about uh, the next pandemic, <laughs> hopefully, fingers crossed. But uh, thank you for, for how you uh, made this possible and, and how, you, how the, the discussion went. I'm really, really happy about that. All right, thank you, everybody. <laughs> that was great. <laughs>
And I have a suggestion just to wrap up everything. Uh, uh, do you guys want to uh, show up your cameras so I can take like a screenshot of the yeah, participants that's why I here? The... Rob leaving. That was sad. Oh, that was very sad indeed. Well, there are many people that have been here for many other uh, sessions, but yeah. I'm not here as well. So yeah, maybe we can do like a montage with everyone or something. Well, that would be great. So give them 10 seconds to turn on the cameras because still some people haven't. Come on, 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I All right, so everyone's my, I guess. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, perfect. <clears throat> All right, very nice. Well, thank you, everybody. Good luck with everything and um, um, be, take care and uh, stay safe. <laughs> See you soon. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Bye. All right.